studying one of the last remaining indigenous uh, hunter-gatherer societies in the world. And he's looking at their diet. Um, and in that interview, you saw where he completely agrees with you is he says, they actually avoid most vegetables, particularly stems and leaves because of the anti-nutrient content. They won't eat those things unless they have to, even though they're in the jungle, those things are readily available. Um, what he found was this hunter-gatherer society ate a lot of fruit, ate a lot of meat. <laughs> Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What is up, you guys? Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Fundamental Health Podcast. We are now one week closer to the release of the second edition of The Carnivore Code. You can go to thecarnivorecodebook.com to pre-order your ebook, print, or audiobook now. Super exciting things are happening in the space. Thank you so much for all of your support. We are so excited that this book is going to reach lots and lots more people and affect lives positively. This episode of the podcast is with Lauren Cordain and his graduate students, really the guys who originated The Paleo Diet, a huge fan of his uh, am I, and it was one of the first books that I read that actually got me thinking about Paleolithic diets and all of these themes. So we get into a lot of interesting things in this discussion. One of the more challenging things for me as a content producer, as a writer, as a doctor in the space is that my ideas are constantly changing because I pride myself on not being dogmatic. This episode was recorded in February of 2020, shortly before the book was published. And it, you, the second edition is coming out in August of 2020, so now six months after the release of the first edition. And even in those first six months, I have been continuing to learn and adjust and modify my ideas about some of the concepts. I think there probably will be a third edition of The Carnivore Code and maybe even a fourth edition, but this is one of the challenges for me as a writer is the way that ideas are changing. So one of the ideas that we talk about in this podcast with Lauren Cordain is salt. I have not changed my perspective on salt. In the show notes for this episode, you will find no less than 15 references uh, shared with me in collaboration with my friend James DiNicolantonio, showing that salt restriction leads to insulin resistance and worsening of outcomes, worsening of erectile dysfunction, worsening of orthostasis or orthostatic hypotension, low blood pressure when you stand up or change positions from seated to standing quickly. So I have really no clinical, scientific, uh, personal doubt that adequate sodium intake is crucial for humans and is something our ancestors would have uh, done repeatedly and sought out with uh, significant intention. I will respectfully disagree with the Cordain group on this uh, sense in this regard. And as you will hear in this podcast, we, we get into a little bit of a debate about this at the end. One of the more challenging issues that I've been wrestling with over the last few months is fructose. And as you'll hear in this podcast, we all kind of toss it around and say, is this a problem? Is it not? I am planning to do a couple, at least one or two podcasts in the near future dedicated exclusively to fructose. If you are following my stuff, you'll know that in the first tier of a carnivore diet, as I talk about in the carnivore code, you can go to thecarnivorecodebook.com to get a pre-ordered copy. Uh, I think fruit is one of the least toxic foods for humans from plants. As one of the most interesting parts of this interview from these guys in the paleo diet group was a discussion of this group of indigenous hunter gatherers in um, South America and the research of a gentleman called, uh, I believe, Douglas London, which we talk about in detail. And he looked at basically these hunter gatherers and what they were eating. These are the Kai Menno people, spelled K A W Y M E N O. We talk about it in detail in this podcast. I will try and publish an actual interview that this group did with the uh, with Douglas London. But basically, as you'll hear us talk about, they eat over 70 varieties of fruit and they generally avoid vegetables. This is really the next incarnation of, quote, a paleo diet, which is looking a whole lot like a carnivore-ish type diet to me. 
And when I hear this, I think that makes a lot of sense. This came up in the podcast that I did with Bill Von Hippel as well, and I've been wrestling with this idea. And what I have recently learned is that a lot of the research put forth by Robert Lustig and those who vilify sugar, or specifically fructose, is done in animal studies, in which the rates of de novo lipogenesis happen much more quickly with fructose than they do in humans. Furthermore, the amounts of fructose that are used in these studies to suggest these high rates of DNL that I talk about in this podcast are with massive amounts of fructose, really amounts of that that you could not achieve very easily at all in any normal human diet. So I think that uh, my ideas about this continue to evolve and, uh, and explore And I continue to explore these ideas. And I think that is what we all want to do is to continue to learn and explore. So please listen to the podcast with that stuff in mind. It was recorded six months ago, then coronavirus happened. And none of this is terribly relevant during coronavirus, but I still think this is a great conversation that I should release. And it's a very cool conversation, especially about this inclusion of fruit in many other gatherer diets. And I think it corroborates a lot of the things I was talking about in the book with tier one carnivore diet. So with that in mind, I hope you will enjoy this podcast with these guys. And I hope that you will um, check out the first edition of the Carnivore Code. Please go to amazon.com. Leave me a review. If you've read the first edition, it helps us reach more people. If you like this podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes. Thank you so much. Thank you to my sponsors, Blue Blocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD for 15% off your order. They are making what I believe to be the best blue blocking glasses out there. I've got the clear ones, which are the Jaspers and the orange lenses. If I want to go to a restaurant at night and look like a cool hipster and block the blue light or look like a studious graduate student that I no longer am, I can wear my blue blocking glasses. Or if I want to be totally Elton Johned out and super hipsterified, I can wear the orange lenses. Or... If I need a sleep mask, they have what I believe is the best one on the market. Makes you look like a really awesome bug and doubles as a great Halloween costume. So they've got you covered for your bug Halloween costume. October is around the corner, my friends. So check out blueblocks.com and get into the dark, whether it's with your eyes during the day with blue blocking glasses or at night with a good sleep mask. I really like what they're doing and appreciate the science and consideration. They make a really great product. I'm happy to support them. Please check out Nutrisense.io. They are the CGM company that I so appreciate and support. They were kind enough to do that whole Continuous Glucose Monitor podcast episode with me that you should definitely check out detailing my CGM results. Interestingly, I've done a CGM in which I had a good amount of honey in a day and it did not make me insulin resistant and I didn't have evidence for major de novo lipogenesis with changes in body composition. So I'm still learning as well and I think we all should be and it should not be anathema to suggest that ideas can change and evolve. So check out Nutrisense.io. I really think that including a CGM in your life will give you a very clear indication of your glucose sensitivity. I'm super stoked for my dad to do this in the near future. I will share his results and you can let him know I sent you. Nutrisense.io, check out that podcast. You will learn a ton. These are going to revolutionize the world because I think it is so powerful. The Uh, how humans will change their behavior when they are met with real-time feedback. My friends at White Oak Pastures are always uh, great sponsors of this podcast, whiteoakpastures.com. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD for 10% off your first order. They, simply put, are making some of the best meat on the planet. They have grass-fed, grass-finished beef, lamb, pork, chicken, which they are working on getting to be low PUFA now, which is super exciting for me. And you can get amazing eggs Uh, All kinds of good stuff there. They have suet and organ meats. They are a sixth generation farm that is now regenerative for the last 20 years. You can see in the book and many other places that the amount of carbon in the soil there is increasing significantly. And that, I believe, is the main metric that will determine the persistence of human life on this planet. So big deal. Super, super important. Please support them and Blue Box and NutriSense and give my book a review on Amazon if you have read it. Appreciate that. Stay tuned for super exciting projects coming from me in the next few weeks on how to get more nose to tail nutrition. If you do not subscribe to my newsletter, what are you doing? Go to carnivoremd.com, get subscribed as a fundamental health insider. I will send you a newsletter every week with happenings, pre-release, good stuff, and all kinds of information about podcasts, interesting articles I've been reading, It is the spot to get information from me, you guys. So one last thing, if you want to be entered into a drawing for a signed edition of the Carnivore Code pre-released before you even get it on August the 4th, see the posts I've been doing on Instagram about this, comment, tag a friend who needs to read this book, and I will enter you in the sweepstakes, and a couple of lucky winners will get signed copies of the Carnivore Code into your Carnivore 
omnivore, meat-eating, meat-appreciating hands before the book is even out on August the 4th. And the new edition looks amazing. Like I said, there will be a third and fourth edition probably because we will continue to learn, but that's what we want. <laughs> no one should stay stuck in their dogma. Anyone who is not updating their ideas is a dinosaur, <laughs> in my opinion. So this is a challenge of writing a book, and I appreciate all of your support as we continue to learn and grow together and move toward what I believe is some pretty damn radical health. So listen after this podcast for what is going on with me. All right, we're live. Thanks to you guys for coming on. We've got Dr. Lauren Cordain, Trevor Connor, Mark Smith. This is like the paleo crew. So thank you all for being here. Well, thank you for having us. We really appreciate this. Yeah, and I love that. I, I, I definitely want to start out by saying that I'm a fan of Dr. Cordain's work. I read The Paleo Diet a long, long time ago when it first came out. It was really uh, groundbreaking at the time and has pushed a lot of things in the right direction. I think since that time, everybody's been trying to understand, you know, what the paleo diet is. And like you guys have talked about in your work, people define it different ways. And I think that's kind of what we're all talking about today. Um, I think that we all certainly agree that looking at anthropology and at looking at where humans have come from can give us great insights into how to create health uh, in our current diets. So I really appreciate all the work you guys are doing for sure. I think that uh, with that, I think a good starting point is uh, I use an analogy with Trevor early today. I mean, I've been involved with this since the late 80s, early 90s. I was Dr. Cordain's first graduate student involved with paleo nutrition. And to me, it was kind of like, well, this makes sense. It was based on what foods were naturally available to us. And as you say, from an anthropological perspective, what could have influenced our genetics? I'm like, here we go. I just QED and I just went with it. And for a long time, just worked clinically with people and saw great results. So obviously that influences you a lot. But I, I said to Trevor, really and truly, if we buy into, which obviously you do, that we're talking about foods that are naturally available, people that feel that way, we're kind of all on the same team. So really what we're then discussing is we're trying to pick the best team and which players are we trying to put on the team. And, and that's where we might have some disagreements. Go, wait a minute, my right wing is better than your right wing, or we think, but let's, let's hear your argument, let's hear our argument. So I think if we come at it from that perspective, I've always said to people, is like, I'm, I wouldn't have adopted the Paleolithic diet if I was closed-minded. So I've always been open-minded, and I think we all three of us are, and we just want the science to kind of lead that. Um, we're probably going to discuss that open letter that was out there, and I love the, the way that they wrote it in terms of respectful and saying, hey, we, we want to be proven wrong, and we're the, kind of the same way. So I think if we come at it from that perspective, we're just going to have an enjoyable discussion that our goal is always to find the best diet for humans. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. I love it. Uh, Dr. Saladino, I'll say, I mean, I was listening to your podcast on the drive up to Dr. Cordain's uh, house this morning, and I can't remember the exact wording, but your opening was something on the lines of, of saying you're, you were seeking a, a natural diet to improve uh, people's health. And I just heard that and went, okay, I like this guy. I like what you're about. This is, this is <laughs> what we're trying to do here. Yeah, you know, we try try really hard not to be dogmatic. Obviously, I'm super excited and interested in the carnivore diet, and we'll probably get your your opinions from 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 this group of researchers about it. Um, but but I, I try not to be dogmatic, and I think that ultimately, what I hope to offer my listeners and everyone in the community is ideas around which foods can create health and and reverse disease in humans. And that's the conversation we're all trying to have. And I've openly said yep. that if somebody is if somebody's thriving on any diet, who am I to tell them to change it? I would never tell them to change it. But I think that a lot of people are not thriving. I think that the majority of people who listen to this podcast, even you know, all of us can probably have improvements, whether it's in energy or mental clarity or libido or body composition. Everybody still wants to get better. And, and I think that a lot of people have been told that they, um, the diet has no influence on their health. The diet, diet has no influence on autoimmune illness or inflammatory illness. And that is a huge disservice to humans. And then furthermore, you know, people, there is this trend now, which is from the team that's sort of separate from ours, the plant-based team, not the animal-based team. I yes. hear more and more that people are going to physicians uh, with illnesses, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or uh, autoimmune illness or whatever, and, and they're being told to do plant-based diets. And I think, okay, if that helps, great. But if that makes you worse, I want people to know that there are other options out there and that there's a large a group of researchers, there's a large group of people 
um, who believe that animal foods are very beneficial for humans, that have been a central part of human diets forever. They are not hurting us. And that to remove all animal foods is likely going to hurt people. Now, one step beyond that is kind of where I go with the carnivore diet, how we would, and I think actually the similarities between our ways of thinking are, are very uh, are very strong in that we are constructing hierarchies of plant toxicity. I think we all agree that well-raised animal foods, uh, grass-fed, grass-finished animal foods, primarily from ruminant animals uh, that are fed a species-appropriate diet um, is, is a central part of the human diet. And then we are all just drawing a plant toxicity spectrum a little differently. So, and even in my book, which is out, by the time this podcast comes out, my book will be out, you guys. Um, I have a plant toxicity spectrum and I talk about a carnivore-ish diet. And that's just sort of my, you know, reprisal of a plant toxicity spectrum. So we'll dig into all that today. But what I worry about is that there is a movement now, there is a zeitgeist toward plant-based diets. And I think these are hurting us, our children, our families, and they're bad for the environment because they destroy the proper ecosystems and they foster monocrop agriculture. So I couldn't agree with you all more. Yeah, I think that um, uh, going back to when I first met Dr. Cordain and we started doing this, we actually started uh, using the diet to help with autoimmune patients. So the first thing we did, we're like, well, this, this in theory sounds good. Essentially, back then, it was called an elimination diet. So that's removing grains, removing dairy, removing legumes. So removing things that you, the humans can't eat without some processing. And our first thought was, well, let's do a dietary analysis. Are we going to miss anything? And the first thing we realized was that we actually improve the nutrient uh, content of the food. So that's exactly what we were doing. And certainly you know, the anti-nutrients that are in the plants, obviously, is what you're referring to, and we would agree. Could yeah. I, uh, before we get started, I'd, I'd like to just do a few introductions, because um, as I mentioned, I, I've kind of handed over uh, my website, my business, and everything to the two best graduate students uh, I had over a 32-year career. And Mark Smith, uh, he's a PhD in physiology. Uh, Dr. Smith was my first graduate student that was when I first got interested in this whole concept uh, back in the oh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, I was teaching a, a graduate level course in this and uh, Mark uh, and another PhD student of mine uh, came over to my office every Tuesday and we worked on a paper that we eventually published in the British Journal of Nutrition on rheumatoid arthritis and diet. And so that paper was very revolutionary because we were the first people before Fasano's group came out with the, the notion that autoimmunity begins in the gut. And uh, so we published that paper. And then a decade later, or maybe even longer than that, my last graduate student, uh, Trevor Connor, an MS degree, uh, and he should have gotten his PhD, but he got there's a story behind yeah. that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so anyway, uh, Trevor was my last student, and he also worked on an autoimmune project, a really uh, revolutionary project. Uh, and he can talk to you a little bit about that. So that's kind of the the connecting thing uh, theme amongst all of us. And uh, they all took my courses. Uh, I, I taught research design and statistics, and uh, uh, this evolutionary uh, medicine class that uh, I was able to teach my ideas on, on diet and nutrition. So that's what I have to say to start off. The, Thank you for that. Uh, I wish, I'll just say, Dr. Cordain, that I wish I could have been one of your students. I wish I'd been <laughs> able to take those classes because I was reading the paleo diet. You know, people who listen to my podcast may know this. You know, I was a raw vegan for a while, uh, for seven months and had all sorts of problems like extreme gas and bloating and I was no fun to be around in a small enclosed space like an office and I lost 25 pounds of muscle mass and I was like this is not a human species appropriate diet and I think it was sometime around then that I found your work and I thought oh this would be so cool uh so that's I mean it's been you know you've you've been on my on my brain for many many years and this is such a neat thing to actually get to talk to you now look at where well, we've all ended up but well thank you for having me on your show yeah and so I love this concept and I think that we're all in agreement here that, that foods, um, perhaps primarily plant foods, can trigger inflammation uh, in the gut 
and that may lead to autoimmunity. That's a concept that I think Western medicine will probably wake up to in about uh, maybe 20 years from now, you know? Um, but I think, like you said, I think your group was the first, you know, group of people kind of saying this, and we're, we, we'll get into the plant toxicity spectrum and how we might all draw it differently. But I think this notion that, that the food we eat is clearly damaging the gut, whether directly or indirectly or we can talk about the mechanisms. And as you suggest, Dr. Cordain, you know, Alessio Fasano, if people are not familiar with him, he's a, uh, I believe, a pediatric gastroenterologist at Harvard who's done a lot of research with gluten and the gluten molecule. And the way that gluten molecules and specific fragments of gluten, gliadin, can trigger the release of a compound called zonulin, which is almost our gut's intrinsic signal to open the floodgates, to open those tight junctions, to open the, uh, the occluding channels, to open the tight junctions between the cells that make up our gastrointestinal epithelium, open the floodgates, allow water, and allow immune cells from the immune system layer, the lamina propria, which is just uh, on the human side of our gut lining, into the gut to combat some perceived invader or an inflammatory insult. So this is a fascinating thing. And I think that as you suggest, I really believe uh, that so much autoimmune inflammatory illness begins in the gut. So it's all about the food we eat, right? That's well, huge. We're, we're speaking the same language because those terms that you use, I don't know if your listeners understand all that stuff, but these are uh, concepts that Mark and Trevor and I talk about regularly, and we trade scientific papers. Uh, so uh, I respect you that uh, you've done your homework yeah. and you understand these fundamental concepts. And, you know, for the average person, you talk about these concepts and you say leaky gut, and that's enough. You don't have to go into that kind of detail, but we do. It all, uh, so I'll just quick addendum to what Dr. Cordain was saying before is uh, I was his last graduate student. He had a couple years with me and just went, boy, time to retire. <laughs> <laughs> but my thesis paper was entirely about the effects of wheat on autoimmune disease, looking at how it can spark an immune response that eventually leads to various autoimmune conditions. So what I was really looking at is it creates this imbalance between, and I don't know how deep down these rabbit holes you want us to go, but between- Go deep, man. My listeners love it. This is a geeky podcast, man. I love it. So you know, I talk all the time about the TH17 versus T regulatory cells. TH17 is a type of immune cell that was designed to really, most of the time, be very downregulated because it's a very damaging type of, of cell. Um, but it was designed to handle any sort of bacterial infection. Um, it upregulates, it goes and kills the bacteria, but boy, it does a lot of damage to your body as well. Then it downregulates, and then the dominant T cells, the T regulatory cell, which keeps your immune system downregulated. So my whole thesis was looking at the variety of ways, not just gliadin, but you're looking at WGA, you're looking at amylase trypsin inhibitors. Wheat has this remarkable mechanism for getting past the gut barrier, as you were pointing out, the, the elevation of, of zonulin to open up tight junctions, get into circulation, emulate LPS, and cause this, this imbalance between TH17 and Treg, and keep that upregulated. And you read any study on any autoimmune disease, and they all say this condition is preceded by elevated TH17. I love it. And so I'll just clarify some of those terms for listeners. T helper 17 is one of the subtypes of a T cell. So in the immune system, we have T cells and B cells, which are part of the adaptive immune system. And then we have an innate immune system, which is made of dendritic cells and macrophages. But what Trevor is referring to is T helper 17, which are balanced by T regulatory. And there are other types of T cells. Immunology is just a flurry of alphabet soup. But, and then a couple <laughs> other acronyms that Trevor used, I want to point out, we're talking about gluten, which has a fragment called gliadin. And then there is also wheat germ agglutinum, WGA. And I talk about WGA in my book, which is a lectin. It is a carbohydrate binding yeah. protein. And then you also about, talk about amylase and trypsin inhibitors. These are intrinsic to many grains. Um, so one of the things I talk about in the book is that plant babies, plant seeds especially, do not want to get eaten. And they have all sorts of these amylase and trypsin inhibitors. We see this kind of 
across the, uh, the various plant species with some variation. But, and plant seeds broadly is seeds, grains, nuts, and legumes. And we can talk about the nuts and seeds versus the grains and legumes, which we may differ in opinion on. But what we're talking about here is that plant babies, I think most of us would agree, go on the far end of the spectrum of plant toxicity. These are pretty toxic things. Plants don't want these to get eaten and they put all sorts of things yeah. in them to kind of really mess with our guts. Would you guys agree with all that? Yeah. yeah I, 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 I want to jump in ahead, a little Mark. bit. On, sorry, it was long done. No, go ahead, Mark. I, I was going to jump in with one, a case study story that is, is kind of a, a fascinating thing that we did. As I said, when we first started doing this, we were doing it for autoimmune patients. Um, so there's a couple of things. I think that you can look at clinically, some people are going to have issues with a leaky gut. And so that plays into it. But you've also got the epidermal growth factor uh, thing there as well, where you may have an intact gut, but basically some of these lectins, these dietary, uh, and uh, you know, I always say to my, my clients and patients, kind of nutrition 101, a protein should get digested in the stomach. These lectins are resistant to the proteolytic enzymes in the gut. And if it's a leaky gut, or if in fact it can bind that receptor and get it into your systemic system, you've got something that shouldn't be there in its intact state and that's where all sorts of problems could arise so and obviously the dairy equation comes into it you know it points out you've got something like uh, a 5,000 fold <laughs> increase in epidermal growth factor which we have in our saliva to help repair the gut in small quantities but then someone consumes milk and it's meant for a calf not for a human and you have a 5,000 fold increase, it upregulates that receptor, and all of a sudden you've got a lot more of these lectins getting into the systemic system. So I think we're gonna have a huge spectrum of genetics there, of some people getting affected more than others. But I wanted to just, and I think this is important perhaps for your listeners, when you talk about autoimmunity, about the need to be strict for certainly a while to determine what foods might be a problem. We had a, as I said, we were working with autoimmune patients, and. I was sort of going off doing lectures almost uh, on Dr. Cordain's behalf. I did want to remember to uh, some hunters who were loving the message that we were sending out. <laughs> uh, I think I was featured in Bow Hunter magazine. Was it <laughs> yeah, something like that? And, uh, you went up uh, into the, the mountains of Colorado for that, didn't you? Went to one of the churches. That was interesting. They were a modern church that believes the the, the earth was, I think, four thousand years old. So oh. I had to kind of change how I approached selling the concept. But anyway, the point was we were getting um, information back from people, requests to sort of, they wanted to try this. And there was one particularly interesting case study, a lady with multiple sclerosis. So we said, okay, well, we know we're not hurting you. We've done a dietary analysis. We feel we've got a good diet. We think it might help. So she goes on the diet and immediately starts to see improvements. Um, in another meeting with another friend that had fibromyalgia, wanted to do it. In that discussion, she mentioned she liked green beans. And I mistakenly said, oh, that's more uh, alkaline. I think you can probably consume those. It was a bad recommendation, but um, she went home. She loved them, ate them for a couple of days, got on the phone with me and said, I, I clearly can't do green beans. I got on the phone with Dr. Cordain. She said, yeah, same genus. You know, we, we shouldn't be doing that. Whoops, sorry, mistake learned. Further down the road, looking at some of the research with multiple sclerosis, we were trying to get the uh, DHA levels elevated, which had been shown to help in certain circumstances. Docasa, hexanoic acid, so one of the omega-3 fatty yeah, acids. Yep. Essential, you know, so fish oil, DHA, and EPA, this is the DHA component. Uh -huh. uh, found a lot in brain tissue, actually. So anyway, I, you know, back then, didn't work with good quality supplements. Just sent her to the local health food store and said, See if you can get some DHA, we think that might help. She goes home, takes two, I think, two capsules of DHA. Calls me up and says, well, clearly I can't do this DHA. I, I had a terrible reaction to it. And I'm like, going, that, that just seems strange. Dr. Cordain and I were talking, we're trying to figure it out. And go, you know what, maybe there's something else in that, that pill. I said, get, get the bottle, read out what's on the, um, on, the bill, on the bottle for me. And she said, Okay, it says that the uh, gelatin capsule is darkened with a herbal extract, carob. That's not a herbal extract. That's a <laughs> bean extract. Carob is a bean extract. We'd already established that legumes and beans are not good for her. So I don't know how much was in that, but it's kind of like a kid with a peanut allergy. I don't think you need a lot 
to trigger that whole immune system. So when you are trying to deal with an autoimmune case, you do have to be strict for quite some time to try and clean the system out. And then you can reintroduce things to see if they're offending, but you have to do it one at a time too. And obviously you can do lab tests and stuff like that. But, but I always, that's always a story of a case study that we, we found rather remarkable. Mark, I, I think this is a good uh, point to bring up uh, wheat germ agglutinin, WGA. And um, the doctoral student that I had before Trevor, uh, her master's thesis was to feed people um, wheat germ. Yeah. So we fed them 100 grams of wheat germ, which was pretty nasty things to do. And yeah. I think they downed it with some orange juice. Yeah. And then... Uh, we kept them in the lab for the first six hours and drew blood at one hour, three, six. And then we had them come back the next day and drew blood at 24 hours. And so what we were interested in was our, our working hypothesis was that uh, when you ingest wheat germ or WGA, it ultimately gets into your system. So uh, we thought it would be pretty obvious where we're gonna find it. So what we did is we drew um, whole blood and we spun down the plasma and we threw out the erythrocytes and the other formed elements. And so when we, and then I worked with a guy from Austria and his uh, group who developed an assay to measure WGA in human plasma. And so we spiked the plasma WGA to make sure the damn thing worked. And uh, lo and behold, we came up with absolutely nothing. There was no WGA in plasma. So we went back and we looked at the plasma proteins. There's about 60 of them. And there's only one plasma protein. It's a very minor one that binds WGA. So what we suspect has happened in that experiment is we threw out the baby with the bathwater is that the WGA was bound to erythrocyte um, proteins and also leukocyte proteins. So we did this whole experiment. We got everybody involved. We had to go across countries. We had to go uh, you know, from Europe to the United States with human tissue and, and so forth. And the whole thing was a big bust. And so I just was kicking myself, going, why the hell did we throw out those red blood cells? That, that component, and that's interesting. So what we're talking about here are lectins. And I talk about this in my book. These are carbohydrate binding proteins. Um, this is one thing that I agree with Dr. Stephen Gundry about. It's probably the only thing I agree with Dr. Stephen Gundry about, right? But um, there's a whole chapter in my book about this, and we're talking about wheat germ agglutinin. There are other lectins. Gluten is kind of a, it can be considered a lectin. There are lectins in kidney beans. We're talking about lectins in grains and beans. And I, if I understand you properly, Dr. Cordain, what you're saying is that the lectins were binding to cells of the human body. They were actually binding to white cells, binding to red blood cells, and they were having potentially uh, some biological activity. So they were in a different fraction of the blood than you expected. And that was why you didn't see them. But it, it certainly, um, it suggests that they are binding to our cells and potentially exerting negative physiological effects. Am I understanding that properly? That's exactly right. And we believe that the uh, lectin that's found in uh, kidney beans and all the other phaseolus uh, beans is uh, PHA, phytohemagglutinin. And, and in, in rat models, we definitely know that phytohemagglutinin gets through into the system. And the same thing with WGA. So what our study was unusual is that we were attempting to do the first human study to show that uh, lectins got into the sy system. And... Um, you know, it took a little bit of money and funding to get that whole thing going and some time and a, an interested graduate student. But uh, had I done it over again, I would have kept the erythrocytes. Measuring WGA in erythrocytes is a, a more complex uh, situation than in plasma. And I can't remember who the author is, but there's an absolutely fascinating study on WGA that addresses. So as you know, some of the people who, who counter this say, this isn't a factor when you cook wheat, you cook out all the WGA, you cook out all the lectins, it's happening, and it's just not, a, not an issue. Uh, but this paper demonstrated that very, very small quantities of WGA can get past the epithelial cells. And then what they actually do is they bind to the basolateral side of the epithelial cells of the gut. 
and then they get those cells to mount an immune response. So this paper showed that it takes very, very little WGA to really cause a, a fairly significant um, it works, immune response. It works at anagram levels. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, if you look at the research on that, that, it is correct that cooking will destroy, you know, maybe 75%, but it's kind of a so what <laughs> when you, like, how much arsenic do you need, you know? So. <laughs> if it's all toxic, if it's all, yeah, that's been the response. So, you know, I went on the doctor's TV show recently and they were just up in arms. They couldn't believe what I was suggesting with a carnivore diet. And they were saying, you know, we've talked about lectins in the past. They're not a bad thing for humans. And people will say they get disordered. They get denatured when we cook them. And it's like, oh, really? Uh, do they 100% of lectins get denatured? And, um, and there are many foods we eat. And this may be something um, that, that we have slightly different views on. There are many foods, foods we eat that can have lectins that are not cooked. I mean, nuts and seeds. And yeah. I mean, there are, there are many foods we eat that, that have lectins that are not cooked and not denatured at all. So the fact the that there quality, are these... The yeah. quantity amount... My little anecdotal story of the lady with MS is an example of how little you need. Small, um, small right? amounts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's the same. You know, if, if we appreciate that children can have an anaphylactic <clears throat> shock if they have a peanut allergy, surely it shouldn't be too much of a stretch to realize that a low level inflammation or something like an autoimmune response could be as a result of slightly high levels or, or even the same amount of levels if it can create such a shock to, to a child. And I think that another part of the discussion, if we're talking about autoimmunity and the lectins, you know, we've talked a lot in our world about molecular mimicry. And I think it's important for perhaps the audience to appreciate, you know, why is it problematic in one person and not in another? You've got gut health. So sometimes different with the, the um, epidermal growth factor receptor, there could be different quantities. Some people might have leaky gut, some people might not. But beyond that, there is this molecular mimicry concept based on the haplotype, your immune system, we all have different immune systems and how it presents that molecule to the immune system. So a lectin comes in, the immune system effectively binds it and shows it to the immune system. And so depending on where it grabs it, that molecule may or may not look like the self. And so th there's huge complexity within this whole parameter, parameter where yeah, some people are not going to have a problem, other people will. So that for probably for a lot of people might confuse things. It's like, ah, it must be rubbish because it didn't, didn't happen in this person. Just that must have been. No, that, that's absolutely the case. And uh, you know, there are different HLA human leukocyte antigens. There are different HLA haplotypes uh, that present the proteins differently because they bind to different areas of the binding group. So uh, that's fairly well known to immunologists. Yeah, and I talk about this in my book as well. And this is, I think this is why creating a spectrum of plant toxicity is, is a little bit challenging on an individual basis. I think we can draw broad strokes. These are the foods that are most likely to be triggering for, uh, for, for many people. But as you're suggesting, Mark and Dr. Cordain, that, that there, there are going to be individual variations. And just because one person can tolerate it doesn't mean it's going to be good for somebody else. And certain people are going to react to different, uh, different foods. In the, in the book, I talk about Plinko, which is that game on the Price is Right that has all these pins that stick up and you drop a disc and it goes down these pins and ends up in a dollar amount. We all kind of have this individual genetic board, Plinko board with different pins. We all have different genetic susceptibilities, I think, to plant toxins. And that's maybe you know, a foreshadowing of why I might draw a plant toxicity spectrum, spectrum a little more broadly than you guys would. But I think we all have an armor. We all have an ability to sort of detoxify some plant toxins, but not others. And, and we all have chinks in our armor. And those are different places for different people. And the immunologic variability, our sort of individual genetic uh, immunologic fingerprints based on these HLA and MHC, multiple histocompatibility complex haplotypes, um, is, is what determines what it looks like. And this is what's so interesting for me. When, when Mark eats lectins, it might cause eczema. When somebody else eats another plant toxin, it might cause autoimmune thyroid disease. We all have this sort of individual genetic response, but ultimately it's, it's probably the same trigger. It's some sort of immunologic trigger in the gut for many people. It just looks differently for different people. And that's why we see a spectrum of 767,000 autoimmune diseases, which are probably all very similar in their root. Would you guys agree so with what, that? One of the amazing things I found with wheat 
is the number of mechanisms it has to just dysregulate our immune system. And like you said, in each individual, it's going to express differently. And some people, gliadin is going to bind to a particular HLA and you're, you're going to end up with celiacs, but that's not the same for, for other people. The, when you, you mentioned before that some people go, well, it's not an issue because you cook it all out. I actually say that the cooking um, is in some ways the worst things we, we can do. Because if you walk out into a wheat field and just take some raw wheat and you eat it, you're going to have a very unpleasant couple of days and you will never do that again. <laughs> Because you are going to be very violently ill. The what issue that we have to, is, what's what that? Raw bean. If any, I mean, yes. don't do this at home. You got raw beans will kill you. Like yeah. yes. But if but if but, if you try and eat a raw bean, if you ever see a bean on a vine, that will you will be vomiting and diarrhea within hours. Oh, so the, the issue is we we cook it, and you yes, it does get rid of a lot of the lectins, but it's not making it harmless. What it's doing is cooking out enough that you don't have that violent reaction. And what you end up having is this dysregulated immune response that builds over time and leads to these diseases. And unfortunately, we're very immediate people. You eat something, you throw up, you go, I'm not going to eat that again. You eat something and you get heart disease 10 years later, you're not going to make the association. Or eczema two weeks later, right? right? And that's, what's pro that's the problem. And I love that you said this, Mark, that in order to really understand which foods are triggering us, we have to go through extended periods, 30, 60, 90 days of specific intentional eating in which we're completely eliminating those foods. In the book, I call this a clean carnivore reset. It's been called elimination diets in the past, but we have to have periods. We can't have a small amount of gluten, you know, because that's enough to trigger. We can't have a small amount of beans. It doesn't work like other things. It's, this is not a macronutrient-based weight gain body composition equation where it's like, I can have one chocolate chip. It's like, no, you, your immune system is exquisitely sensitive. You can't have one chocolate chip, you know, and I, that's not specifically the example I mean to use there, but you can't have one, you know, bean, you know, that's, that could be enough to trigger your immune system. And that would confound the whole experiment. People won't like, know what's going on. I, I want to just jump in there a little bit. What was interesting clinically, I did find with some people, there did sometimes appear to be a dose relationship. Like the lady with MS, she started saying, I could go to the movie theaters with my kids and I could have three pieces of popcorn. But if I had five, I was done. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I, I mean, I would probably advise not to do any of it because it could, could trigger. But I have seen some cases where it does seem dose related, which might be counterintuitive, but you know. Yeah, interesting. Open so I think that we all are on the same page with the grains and the legumes and the dairy. I've talked about dairy in the past. I'm not a fan of dairy for a variety of reasons. Casein and whey are very triggering for a lot of people. And I do think that this epidermal growth factor stuff is quite interesting. Um, I've seen some research that the dairy actually can contain IGF-1. I, I think evolutionarily, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense for most people to drink dairy. And then the question becomes, why are we doing that? What nutrients are we getting there? It's, it's kind of affecting satiety signals negatively. We should flash up the picture that I use in the lecture and it has a, someone sucking the teeth of a cow. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's strange. And, and of course, there are, there are pastoral cultures that use dairy, but um, I think the vast majority of people that I work with do much better without it. So grains uh, like wheat and, and legumes and dairy, we all agree on. Let's just move a little further on and we'll kind of inch toward carnivore and we can kind of talk about some of the concerns you guys might have here. I, I'm, I, I kind of lump together all the seeds. So I'm not convinced that nuts and seeds are much different than grains and legumes. I think that nuts and seeds are, are also likely to have lectins and are also likely to have digestive enzyme inhibitors. Um, certainly almonds uh, and seeds like this are derived from ancestral fruits that have a lot of cyanogenic glycosides like apricot and stone fruits. But I'm curious what you guys, if you guys have still think that seeds and nuts are okay, or if any of that has evolved, or I, I see them very similarly sort of um, from a phylogenetic perspective. You want, I, I'll, I'll have a stab at it if you want. Um, I, I look at it from a perspective of, of a spectrum. I mean, obviously, if someone's got autoimmune disease, we usually take out what would ordinarily be considered in the modern paleo diet, paleo food. So it could be peppers, could be tomatoes, sorry, tomatoes, um, you know, foods that you're okay with most people. But typically with autoimmune patients, you go, hey, nightshades, you, you sort of want to take those out. So obviously, there are lectins in paleo foods. 
Um, it's whether they become problematic. So I think the genetics can play into that. I think it's a sliding scale to a certain extent. And, and I, I recently just did an article for the paleo diet, Dot com where I was kind of trying to make the case for being paleo. And I said, at the end of the day, it does three things very well. One, it's very good from a control of insulin sensitivity. Two, it provides lots of nutrients. And three, it doesn't provide a lot of anti-nutrients. So I think we all sort of, that, that's the premise of what a good diet is. And then I think that's where we're then arguing the team who's playing on which positions. So I think most of the, when you talk about the seeds and the nuts, I don't see them as problematic as say the, the wheat or, or the grains. But yes, I think for certain individuals, they, they could be problematic. Um, and then that scale would shift even more as we move to sort of vegetables and fruits. And, and so it becomes then a balance of getting the nutrients that the body needs versus eliminating the anti-nutrients and the ability to tolerate anti-nutrients and the ability, frankly, to tolerate not getting nutrients. Like how well can you do without getting the nutrients you need? But ultimately, those are the three things I look at. Insulin sensitivity, getting good nutrients, and not getting anti-nutrients that can be problematic. So I think, I think it, on the same scale there. It's now arguing, okay, yeah. what does that look like? It's funny because that's exactly the same equation that I use to think about a carnivore diet. I just solve it a little differently. You know, it's like you're in calculus and you're like, oh, when I do this integral, I get this. We're doing the same equation. It's just what, yeah. what I see on the other side of the equal sign is a little differently because I think a carnivore diet, and we can talk about this, I want to make sure we cover this, is exactly that. It's all the nutrients that humans need with essentially zero anti-nutrients. I mean, there's room for adjustment in there. And I think people we can talk about some point and counterpoint where you guys might have some issues there. But let's, let's move a little further down. We talked about, so now we've talked about nuts, seeds, grains, and legumes. You well, mentioned- so moving, moving further down, I actually want to throw a question at you because I sent yeah. you that interview I did with Dr. Douglas London. Yeah. Just so your, your, your listeners know, this is a fantastic researcher who's down in Ecuador right now studying one of the last remaining indigenous uh, hunter-gatherer societies in the world. And he's looking at their diet. Um, and in that interview, you saw where he completely agrees with you is he says they actually avoid most vegetables, particularly stems and leaves because of the anti-nutrient content. They won't eat those things unless they have to, even though they're in the jungle. Those things are readily available. Um, what he found was this hunter-gatherer society ate a lot of fruit, ate a lot of meat. And I was wondering what your response was to that. No, I thought it was so fascinating. And that's, that's essentially, if we skip ahead, that's essentially how I would draw the plant toxicity spectrum with an asterisk around fructose, fructose and, and how we feel about, about higher levels of fructose. And so we can get into that. But I definitely think that if we are looking at plants, um, the least toxic part of plants, at least from an anti-nutrient perspective, rather than a sugar Molecule. If we don't, if we just put fructose, you know, put fructose versus side, glucose yeah. aside from an anti-nutrient perspective, the fruit of plants, I think is, is much less likely to have anti-nutrients. In fact, usually has very few. There are some fruits that are poisonous, but very rarely. And in the plant toxicity spectrum that I draw in the book, which is called the carnivore code, I'll have to get you guys a copy. Um, I, I think of the non-sweet fruits, things like squash, avocado, um, olives, uh, and berries as the least toxic, um, the least toxic plant foods, and slightly, you know, moving a little bit further toward the toxicity side, I see the more sweet, kind of hybridized, sugary fruits um, are, are less desirable. But I would think of the non-sweet fruits as as the least toxic plant foods based on individual sensitivities. One one interesting anecdote I'll share quickly, and then I'll throw it back to you guys, is that that I um, did a couple of carbohydrate reintroduction experiments. So I've been eating a strictly nose to tail carnivore diet for the last year and a half plus. And, you know, I was kind of, I want to, I always want to be an experimenter. And so I thought, well, let me introduce just one thing. I'm going to introduce egg corn squash because I was curious, you know, is my gym performance going to change? Am I going to feel differently? Is my body composition going to change? Um, what's going to happen? And my eczema, which was pretty severe prior to going carnivore, came back within five days. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. Like, and of course, there's, it's just N of one, but it's me thinking, Acorn squash triggered eczema for me. That was the reason that I went carnivore in the first place was that even on a pretty strict, organic, autoimmune paleo diet, my eczema persisted. 
And so removing all plant foods was quite helpful for me in many ways that I've talked about in previous podcasts, but reintroducing squash triggered me a little bit. So I thought, oh, that's strange. So I cut it out, the eczema went back away. So I think of those non-sweet fruits, and we don't traditionally think of avocado as a fruit, but it is, you know, and squash is a fruit. Um, those non-sweet fruits, I would think of, you know, my hypothesis, those are probably less toxic to humans. So I think this is quite fascinating that this tribe, uh, it was the Warani, and there was another tribe yeah. you sent me in that, in that well, paper. So the, the particular, so the Warani, and I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation here, uh, is kind of the broader tribe and the particular I don't know, sect or what, I, I don't know how you, you would describe it, but yeah, uh, the particular he group he was yeah. working with was the Kawimeno. And do you know what kind of fruit? I would, I love the details. Like, I wonder what the fruit in the Amazon looks like. Um, you know, it's, it's equatorial. So maybe it is a pretty juicy, luscious yeah. type of fruit. Well, but- one of the things he brought up is they eat a huge variety of fruit yeah. and he compared it to the Western diet where he said, you, you go to the supermarket and buy the fruit you have about 10 things to select from. He said they had over 70 different fruits that they ate. Is that Again, throughout the year or at any one time? Yeah, that's, that's what's fascinating. He said, this is, this is the rainforest. These fruits are available all year round. You can eat them at any time. Yeah. But they would only eat particular fruits at particular times of year. Huh. And wasn't that also, Trevor, based on the, they, he says they can literally sense the phytonutrient right. content of foods and they literally reject foods they know they, it could be yeah time they have over 30 different words to describe the phytochemical taste of foods that was fascinating did you did he say anything about the macronutrient ratios like because it's if they're eating meat and fruit how much of their diet is from fruit do you have any sense of that um you know, I don't have it in front of me and I should have pulled it up before we came here. I looked at the interview. I didn't see it specifically. Yeah. I mean, he did say that by calorie, uh, the meat is the, the highest percentage, but I think it was something on the lines of by, by calorie or by energy, meat was around 55%. We actually mm-hmm. have estimated uh, that in hunter-gatherers in our 2000 uh, Jeff, right here. American Journal Clinical Nutrition paper, and uh, we've broken it down. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but fruit tends to be uh, an item that uh, hunter-gatherers like a lot. And um, at least the contemporary um, studies of hunter-gatherers by ethnographers. I can tell you there's one uh, South American fruit that most Americans eat daily and they don't know that they're eating it. It's called cacao theobroma right well the seed <laughs> they don't right so what what they do is uh, the the fruit itself is allowed to uh, rot and basically ferment and then what are left are the, what are called the nibs and so we grind the nibs up and the nibs become cocoa powder which we right. make chocolate from and um, that's an interesting story that i'm not going to go much further <laughs> that's that's more to come in the future. But I, I do I do have your, your information. That information will come in the future. I do have your paper pulled up here, and just to your points, so you brought up nuts and seeds. Dr. Cordain did an analysis of, of so two hundred twenty nine hunter gatherer societies, and lists all the plant foods they eat. So the it's an N of seven hundred and sixty eight. They have three hundred and seventeen different types of fruits that were identified which accounts for 41.3% of the total plant food the hunter-gatherer societies eat. Nuts is 9.6%, uh, and seeds is 72 and leaves 3.6%. So small. Really small. Yeah, yeah. So this is quite interesting. And I've had this converse, conversation with a number of people recently that, that um, leaves and stems are not really eaten by hunter-gatherer tribes. No. And, and that they, they are probably going to favor things like fruit. Um, and then the question, we can talk about fructose and what we think about the physiology associated with that. What's interesting about the 2000 paper, um, and this is just a counterpoint that I'll offer, is that I wonder um, how the, the animal to plant ratios of hunter-gatherers may have changed with marginalization. One of the things we know about current hunter-gatherer tribes is that they are shorter than their previous generations and that there are political norms now that prevent them from hunting big animals. And so uh, certainly in Africa, we know that the 
uh, the elephants uh, are no longer hunted. And now long, now the elephants are destroying the boabab forest. They'll go over and they'll just, just destroy a boabab tree. Um, and so there, there's different changing landscapes because the indigenous people are not allowed to hunt giraffes and elephants and megafauna. So I wonder when I see these plant to animal subsistence ratios of hunter gatherers, um, if we can really infer much of our history based on what we might have done. I think it probably, my suspicion is that it was different based on latitude and that equatorially we probably ate a lot of animals and fruit. And then as we moved northern climes, we probably ate more animals. But the ratios, I think, may be skewed or there's a potential the ratios could be skewed by current changes, uh, socio-political changes, you know, the Hadza, the Ikung, these people, they, they can't hunt the way they used to. They can't be nomadic the way they used to. They're kind of cloistered. Uh, it's a, different, it's a different, different way of living for them now. And the megafauna have gone extinct, you know, in the last 60,000 years. We don't have a big woolly mammoth to go hunt. So um, one- no, I, I completely agree with you. And I, um, you know, I just want to kind of throw in a little bit more detail about that study. So we did regressional analysis on uh, um, the plant to animal subsistence ratio. And exactly as you predicted, um, as you move in latitude, what happens is plant food is replaced by more fish food. Animal food stays about the same. But the, the, the problem with ethnic, yeah, so actually, got to read here. Okay. So um, the, the problem with, um, ethnographic studies is they're all subjective so somebody has got to go into the field right. and make some sort of uh, non-objective impression of of what they see so we were lucky enough after we we did this paper we did another paper i think we published it in the european journal of clinical nutrition um, where we rounded up the 13 objective studies of hunter-gatherer diets where they actually measured the content. So sometimes what they would do is they'd make two portions of the meal and the scientists would get the other portion and then do the analysis. So there's about 13 studies that have done that. We put them all together in this paper and uh, they tend to agree with, uh, uh, you know, even though the sample size is fairly small, uh, they tended to degree, agree with the larger uh, ethnographic study, which had 229 societies in it, uh, that the average hunter-gatherer diet contained more animal food than plant food. And the ethnographic data, if you use means, it depends on the statistics that you use, but came out to be about 55% animal, 45% plant. Um, but then you have to look at it. Those are estimates based on weight. So you got to go back and do the caloric estimate. So it's, it's still kind of a tricky wicket. I mean, it's an imprecise way of doing things. And there are very few people that now have access to these groups. Doug London, who Trevor mentioned, is one of them. And I've known Doug for a decade or so. And he's one of the guys that has the knowledge to be able to look at what these people are eating and to be able to tell us what is and is not different. Yeah, and this is where I have to give a little plug for, for Dr. London because he's trying to get back down there to do more research. And one of the things he wants to do is the analysis of this, this diet. And what's really important about the hunter-gatherer society he study is, as you point out, there's still lots of hunter-gatherer societies out there, but most of them are not eating and living the way they, they lived and ate a thousand years ago. This is one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer societies that's still living where it's lived for millennia and is still eating the way it used to eat. And that's why it's so important for him to get down there and do this research because this op opportunity to study this is, is disappearing. It's fascinating. And as you mentioned in that interview with him, uh, a highlight that he mentions that they, they are pretty much free from chronic disease, which is probably yes. the most important part of this whole equation that, that they, uh, that they're living in the Amazon, they're uncontacted. How cool is that? And they don't have diabetes or high rates of cancer or other chronic diseases common in Western civilization. I'll also mention, I think it was maybe in the interview that you had or somewhere else I was reading, um, 
they have like 90% of the population has been bitten by a poisonous snake. Yes. <laughs> it was like, oh, no wonder they don't have a life expectancy of 85 years old. You guys <laughs> like they, So anytime somebody says those hunter gatherers die when they're 35, it's like, okay, look, like these are very complex. These are confounded things. They die of different things. If they live to old age, as I have talked about in multiple previous podcasts, generally speaking, hunter-gatherer populations have what is called squaring of the morbidity curve, where they do not suffer chronic yeah. illness, which is why all four of us are even having this conversation, because these are sort of the people we are trying to emulate in their escape from chronic disease, but they suffer different things. They get bitten by pit vipers, you guys. Like, well, I can, I can tell you that is the damn well truth, because... Um, my colleague, uh, Kim Hill, he's a PhD anthropologist. Uh, he was at uh, Arizona State and his wife, Magdalena Hurtado, spent every summer for the last 25 years, 30 years, uh, studying uh, groups in the South American jungle. And he, he is a meticulous scientist. And so he recorded the, the mortality rates from various causes. And you're absolutely right. Um, in this one uh, hunter-gatherer tribe, the number one cause of death was snake bite. And that, that, that is going to confound estimates of life expectancy. So. <laughs> right. well, I, so, I, I wrote a, so Bill Dye, the science guy, did that whole video talking about how horribly, how horrible it was for our Paleolithic ancestors that they lived short lives, unhealthy lives, all this sort of stuff. <laughs> So I went and went through some of the anthropological research. And actually one of the things I found was very fascinating is most, what really brought down the, the average age of, of death was childhood mortality. Yeah. They showed that if you live past the age of 14, your life expectancy was basically the same as it is now. Exactly, without chronic disease, with squaring of the mortality right. curve, exactly. And the other thing I'll just mention about the hunter-gatherer plant-animal ratios is that um, it's so fascinating, and I think, I think Weston Price and a number of others have observed this, that yeah. the amount of animals in the diet was really dependent on how much they could get. It was like they ate as much as they could get. If they could get, if they could get more, they ate more. And it probably changed, and I talked about this in the debate I had with Chris Masterjohn, that, that I that there are, um, there are instances recorded. And again, as you point out, Dr. Cordain, the ethnography is so challenging. If a tribe in Africa takes down a large animal, like when they can get an, a buffalo or a water buffalo or whatever they're hunting, you know, an elephant, they will eat that exclusively for a week, you know? And it's, in that case, it's like, if they have the meat available, they may have periods where they are exclusively carnivorous and who knows. So it's interesting for me that, that the more meat they could get, the more meat they ate. And um, Weston Price also contrasts a couple of tribes, the Maori and the Kikuyu in Africa, and notes that the Maori were much more robust and ate many more animal foods than the Kikuyu. And these are, they're pretty much neighbors in, in Africa. And the Kikuyu were much more agrarian and, and were not as robust. And so I think we all agree that the more animal foods uh, that, that hunter gatherers can get, the more they will eat. And that generally, the more in their diet, the better they do. Now, the, the extreme end of that is this carnivore diet. And I want to get into that, but I just want to highlight a few things about fructose before we do that. Um, so I, I, I hear this and I hear these hunter gatherers eating all this fruit. And then I see all this research and I think, well, it's hard for me to make sense of all of it. And I'll just highlight a couple of things here for people and, and I'll, I'll, I'll get your thoughts. And then I want to make sure we have time to actually, actually talk about some of this other stuff. So I don't know if you guys have seen this paper. I'll do a screen share here. Um, this one is interesting, fructose, uricase, and the back to Africa hypothesis. Um, if you guys are listening on iTunes or anywhere, you can find this on YouTube. Basically, what this paper is suggesting is that um, there was a, a, a mutation that occurred in our uricase gene, which increased our serum levels of uric acid. Uric acid is a very complex conversation. But that, that fructose in combination with uric acid um, may um, potentiate the storage of fat. So uric acid has been found to potentiate the effect of fructose to increase fat stores, suggesting that the mutation provided a survival advantage. What's so interesting that they're suggesting here is that by getting this uricase mutation, we may have been able to become fatter by eating fruit, um, and that may have allowed us to survive harsh winters. So the question for me then becomes, if we are not calorie deficient, does fruit serve a role in our diet? Does, uh, does do high fructose diets benefit humans? 
The other paper I'll point out, um, uh, why didn't it do that? Let me try again here. Stop the share and then I'll do one more time. Um, see if we can get this to work. Um, let's see if this one works. So this other paper is fascinating. Uh, this is Robert Lustig, who is no fan of fructose. <laughs> Oh, talks about by the title. <laughs> yeah, fructose, it's alcohol without the buzz. This is actually a great paper. I'll just highlight a few things. Um, the hepatic glucose metabolism is pretty different than hepatic ethanol metabolism. Ethanol is uh, alcohol, uh, essentially. And that's also very different than hepatic fructose metabolism. Uh, without getting too deep in the weeds here, I'll just point out to the listener that uh, there's a GLUT5 transporter in the liver, which essentially extracts all of the fructose from the circulation. Uh, fructose is phosphorylated independently of insulin to fructose 1-phosphate by the enzyme fructokinase. And this is where the concerns I have arise biochemically. And I guess we're still learning here, and I'm, I'm not convinced that I have this figured out. But the concern is that with fructose biochemistry, different things happen, ultimately leading to, the act, to de novo lipogenesis, right? So you get xylulose 5-phosphate, potent stimulator of protein phosphorylation, uh, potent, simula potent stimulator of protein phosphatase 2A, activates carbohydrate responsive element binding protein, which is CREB, uh, stimulating the activity of de novo lipogenesis. Fructose also stimulates PPAR alpha, cofactor 1 beta, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then this is what's confusing to me, that human studies demonstrate a rate of fractional de novo lipogenesis of 2% with glucose, yet up to 10% after six days of high fructose feeding. And it goes on to say, um, a recent human study demonstrated that fructose feeding increased fractional de novo lipogenesis to 17%. So my point here is really just to, uh, I guess, to share that there's, I, I'm not, I don't, I think there's questions that remain for me about fructose overfeeding. Uh, and for the listener, de novo lipogenesis is basically when we take carbohydrate and make it into fat. And yes, it can happen that this is sugar into fat. It generally doesn't happen in extreme amounts, but it appears to happen more avidly with fructose. So well, I guess you, I, you, I worry about these high yeah. fruit diets because okay. of these type of things. When, when you talk about a Western diet, yes, that, uh, that's what demonstrated even in kids that you're getting fatty liver disease. Because the, the other important thing to remember about fructose is it enters glycolysis right below phosphofructose kinase, which is the rate limiting enzyme in that whole process. So when you take in fructose, you are processing no matter what. You're, your liver ends up with all this uh, lactate or pyruvate, depending on, on which theory you believe, that has got to do something with. And that's why it ramps up DNL, because it's got to do something with, with all this end product of, of glycolysis. Okay. Um, and certainly on a Western diet where you're eating a lot of high fructose corn syrup, that's a major issue. And sorry, Mark, I interrupted you. No, 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 not at all. Carry on. Um, you know, I, I was going to say, basically, I, I sometimes smile at this because it's like most of the studies that I've seen, they're using the amount of fructose that you can certainly get in a Western diet that you'd require to eat 16 apples to get the fructose levels. Right. These studies show the negative effect. Like who can eat 16 apples? That's the whole point. In nature, it's, it's you know, mostly fiber. So if you yeah, if you drink fruit juice, yeah, I would agree that can be problematic. But if you eat an apple and drink a glass of water or eat an orange, so clinically, and as well as obviously you've got to look at the activity profile. I'm, I'm a high intensity interval training guy, even more so sprint interval training. So all of my clients, 12 to 16, 20 minutes a week, they're doing all out 60 second sprints. That changes insulin sensitivity. It does a lot of different things to the body. And they're going on a paleo diet and but I've never limited fruit. I've never limited any quantity of what I call animal, uh, you know, uh, free range, naturally fed animals, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds have been my sort of template. Um, and I never really limited it. And I, the success rate's really, really high, particularly when we compare it to uh, a Western diet. Obviously, if we can improve, hey, I'm all open for it. But I think the fruit thing, I've just never seen an issue if they're eating fruit and it's natural, say even with the, the high glycemic things like you know the you know things like watermelon. I mean, it's got the same glycemic index as white bread. But <laughs> you think a watermelon is going to be problematic? I don't personally. It's yeah. I think we need to know. It's, it's that's that's the question. You know, is watermelon bad? That's what everybody wants well, to know. You know, is watermelon hepatotoxic? So Mark, 
Mark brought up something really important. Um, I, I think the glycemic index is a very valuable tool, but it does have one flaw to it. The way they determine the glycemic index of each food is to make you eat enough of that food, depending on who's, who's doing the measure, to consume either 50 grams or 100 grams of, of carbohydrates from that food. If you're eating Skittles, that's easy. It's a bag, and, and you, you can test the glycemic index. For a watermelon to consume 100 grams of carbohydrates, you pretty much have to eat an entire watermelon, which nobody's going to do. So one of the things Dr. Cordain actually taught me, one of the first classes I took with them, is the concept of glycemic load, sure. which is looking at the impact of an actual serving size of the food. And so when you look at the glycemic index of fruit, as Mark said, it's really high. Watermelon's up there with white bread. When you look at the glycemic load, you see an entirely different story, and fruits tend to be very low on the glycemic load. That was why I asked about the the people in in um, you know in the Amazon how much fruit, because my sense is that with fruit we still could get fat. That if we overeat fruit, we we still could overwhelm the liver's ability to process process the fructose. I think I, I think that the fiber in the fruit could affect satiety slightly, uh, but I think fructose is fructose, and if we ingest you know upwards of thirty to forty grams of fructose a day. I would be very concerned that that's going to have negative effects on the liver uh, or the hepatic, you know, de novo lipogenesis, et cetera. I mean, it does in monkeys. We see this in animals, right? And again, humans are not bears. Humans are not monkeys. But in primates, they, they will fatten themselves by just gorging themselves on fruit. Is it a dose-dependent effect? And should we be making fruit a part of our diet? Does it have other things that really make it valuable or not? Yeah, it is a dose-dependent effect. And so I think the argument that Trevor and Mark are making is that it's very difficult to get dosages that are physiologically meaningful. So I, I've spoken at conferences with Lustig and those folks and uh, Jenny Brand Miller, who is Miss Glycemic Index, she's a colleague. Um, so my feeling is that, uh, uh, you know, fruit, for the most part, uh, unless you're, you know, completely blasting on high uh, sugar fruit like grapes or something, uh, it is not problematic. Yeah, yeah. And the only other thing I'll say about fruit and the sugars is the dental stuff, which always worries me. Um, when I was a raw vegan, I got seven cavities within a few Ooh. months. That may have been uh, some combination of uh, fat, a soluble, fat soluble nutrient deficiency as well, but. Um, whenever, uh, whenever I eat fruit, I can like feel it in my mouth and I have really healthy teeth now that I've been doing carnivore, but when I eat fruit, like I, I would not eat a date right now because it would, my teeth would hurt. I would feel like something in my teeth. That's completely subjective, but you guys, I just worry about the dental effects of all that sugar. And I have a number of clients and uh, colleagues who are dentists. And, um, we've talked a lot about the changing pH in the mouth and the acidification that happens in the mouth when we eat a lot of sugars, specifically the simple sugars can change the acidity in the mouth and lead to tooth decay. And I see tooth decay. I mean, this is Weston Price reincarnated, you know, Weston Price is smiling somewhere right now. Yeah. Uh, but well, you know, one thing we'd have to, you know, concede too is the fruit that we eat today is probably quite different from, you know, you right. look at crab apple versus a nice juicy apple that they have today. Um, so I, I, I think that's probably where it's not difficult on a clinical level to look at someone and go, hey, things aren't going in the direction we want it to. We right. need to modify it for you a little bit. So just like the, um, the genetic component to <clears throat> response to lectins, I think the same is going to be true of insulin sensitivity. What kind of activity are they doing? Is the genetics in their, their history of the family history with you know, what kind of um, exercise component is in there? So I, I think that certainly is plausible that it could be problematic for certain people and not for others. And I think as a clinician, you just kind of go, let's, let's modify, let's modify as needed. Yeah. All right. I want to make sure we cover this. Let's just jump into it. What do you guys think of a carnivore diet? And I don't know if you know how I do a carnivore diet. It's nose to tail. Uh, I wrote a book about this, you know, I'm eating the whole animal. It's like, we're all in a tribe. We're going to take down an impala or, uh, water buffalo respectfully, and we're going to eat this whole thing nose to tail. We're going to get fat. We're going to get bones. We're going to get bone marrow. We're going to make some stock out of the bones. We're going to eat some of the small bones to get calcium. We're going to get the liver and the organs for folate and all this stuff. Like, what do you guys think about nose to tail carnivore? Maybe we can offer some point counterpoint here. 
Do you want to take it? Uh, yeah, I, I can go ahead and take that. Um, there's a phenomenon um, that my anthropology uh, um, colleagues talk about, and that concept is called rabbit starvation. And uh, it's a, a well-defined uh, concept that's been recorded time and again in, in the historic literature. And so, um, you know, the, the guys, Lewis and Clark and, and, and many of these famous frontier men encountered it. And so what, how it works is that uh, if you only have small animals to eat, like rabbits or squirrels, um, you die. You can't, sure. you can't survive on that. But that's and, just the fat, right? If we are, if what if we're eating the fat from the animal, we shouldn't get rabbit starvation. I, I right. Know. But the, the, the point is, is that fat, if you measure it in terms of mass on an animal, which is done constantly. So you, you can measure fat mass on any animals. You can do it chemically. You can do it by electric impedance, urea uh, dilution. You can do it all kinds of ways. And what we see is that fat scales linearly with body weight, okay? So the larger the animal, the greater the fat percentage is. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. So uh, squirrels have about 4% body fat by weight, and the balance is protein because mammals generally don't store carbohydrates. Sure. The carbohydrate that is found in muscle uh, deteriorates or is metabolized through rigor mortis after the animal is killed. So all any available carbohydrate in muscle is gone. The liver contains about three to four uh, percent glycogen by weight, and it does remain after the animal dies. But three to four percent of you know, if you have a 200 pound deer, it doesn't amount to very many grams of carbohydrate at all. It's practically none. Right. So basically, the equation that you're looking at now is fat to protein ratio. Mm -hmm. And in our 2002 paper, we developed those cubic relationships. And so what I did to develop those cubic relationships, we took fat percent by weight, and we plotted it against fat percent by energy. And so it, I guess, Trevor, you could call that up. And you can see it's an amazing powerful relationship uh, we had to curve fit the relationship and it's a uh, um, it's a cubic relationship and it has an r of 0.9 an r squared of 0.99 and uh, we use hundreds of samples so those are that's 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 a powerful relationship that we see with nature Right there. Yeah, okay. So, it's, and th these are whole carcass analysis. So, what we saw with uh, at least white tailed deer, uh, we had a range of white tailed deer. I think this is the one. Do you want me to share my screen here? Sure, if you can. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Where's the button to share my screen? Oh, there we yeah, are. Share. The bottom. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, sorry, we're going to, you're going to see you up on the, the left here. And uh, on the right, can you, can you see this now? Yeah. So yeah. there's the, the three uh, graphs that Dr. Cordain's talking about. And, and there's actually see. one on the next page where we used all fish. So uh, this is just a sample of, of deer, but we also have a sample of meat as well. So these are, um, uh, you know, unchangeable relationships. This is a biological reality. So if you look at uh, the body fat percent by weight, and then you plot it against protein by percent of energy. That's this declining in the lower left-hand corner. That's this declining cubic relationship. And so you can see that uh, at very low body fat percentages, the protein content is extremely high. Sure. As, as body fat percentage gets greater and greater, um, then... Uh, the protein percent decreases. Now let's go over here to 15, let's go to, towards the end of the graph, 15%, maybe 17%. You'll notice where that intersects the y-axis. It intersects it at about 35% of energy. Sure. And so 35% of energy represents uh, the, uh, 
the average maximal pro protein ceiling that humans can ingest. And so whether your readers know it or not is nitrogen is toxic. And so we have to get rid of nitrogen by the liver synthesizing urea. And the rate limiting enzyme for the synthesis of urea is a compound called arginosuccinate synthetase. And uh, that's why, so with humans, when we go down to low protein diets, that enzyme is downregulated. When we go to high protein diets, that enzyme is upregulated. And so we, the upregulation stops at about 35, maybe 40% max of calories. And so when an animal has 15% body fat, that is, that is the, the, the size of an animal that you can eat the entire carcass on. You can't. Okay, so how do cats get around this? Cats are obligate carnivores. And so they can eat all the meat that they want. They can get around it because arginosuccinate synthase in cats is not upregulated. It's constantly turned on. So if they eat a ton of meat, then they can uh, metabolize it over the course of a 24, 48 hour period, whereas we can't. And so what does that allow us? That allows us, we we're at about, so if you look at this graph, you can see then that at 35% of protein energy, and if you're only eating an animal diet, then what, what's left? You have to eat fat. Yes. And so if you have to eat fat, uh, if you flip over to my ketogenic diet, criticism of ketogenic diets, and you look at all sources of animal fat, they're devoid of potassium, magnesium, folate, and vitamin C. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. We can talk so, about that. Yeah. So uh, that, that's the point is that uh, over the long haul and also calcium. So it, over the long haul, uh, this is not an ideal human diet. I would not, be, I'd be the first to agree with you that it can be consumed seasonally, but over the long haul, uh, it, it, people don't do well on it. And the best example we have is the Inuit. And so my deceased colleague, Stefan Lindeberg, who's a tremendous scientist, actually analyzed uh, the bones of virtually all studies that have been done with Inuit. And by the time they're in their 50s, they're all osteoporotic. Now, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, I looked at some of those studies. I'd like to talk about that, too. Yeah, I, I had questions about those. Yeah. Um, well, I sent these to Trevor and Mark's or Stefan's analysis, so maybe uh, it would be better if you read those first before. Oh, I looked at them. I looked at them. Oh, you saw Stefan's? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it, it, it probably at this point, it, you know, for the, for the audience, I think it, it comes down to let's, let's agree that obviously there would be in periods of time where people, hunter-gatherers would be on the carnivore diet. We all agree with that. So I think our position is and, and then so your counterpoint would come back and go okay you can do this long term because you get all the nutrients you need and we're going we think you're going to be nutrient deficient at a certain point in time you know i've certainly seen some research with ketogenesis or going on a keto diet that you know obviously tremendous benefits with anti-cancer epilepsy things like that but long term again could be nutrient deficiencies i've seen some hypothyroidism criticism and things like that yeah so i'm I, happy to answer all those i'm prepared to answer all those criticisms yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's really where the discussion yeah is really where we're sort of diverging a little bit yeah. we're saying we think that you would be nutrient deficient mm -hmm. you're going not a problem so which nutrients that's... which nutrients because i can i want to answer dr cordain's criticism here trevor do you mind pulling off the screen share yeah i just wanted to show this because i mean this is the other side of it all this analysis of the, the 229 hunter gatherer societies you didn't find one that was entirely dependent on animal food you also didn't find one that was entirely dependent on plant food there was a broad range but it was always a, a combination Sure, sure. That's what we're showing as well. And all right, right. off the screen. And like, like we talked about it with latitude, uh, that may change as well, that, that, the, that there are populations of people at higher latitudes who have higher amounts of animal foods in their diet. So 
Um, I appreciate the concerns about nutrients, but so the nutrients I heard Dr. Cordain talk about were potassium, calcium, magnesium, folate, and vitamin C that are not found in animal fat. And I want to, I want to talk about those specifically. So calcium is quite easily obtained from animals. Uh, that's in the bones. I mean, we can just, you know, if anyone's ever eaten like a, a wing uh, or a small bone, you can eat the calcium. If everyone, anyone's ever made bone broth with tr trabecular bone, you can crunch on that. So I don't see calcium deficiency as a problem on a well, carnivore you diet. To, you have to be able to start a fire to make bone broth. And fire use in hunter-gatherers uh, is maybe 70,000 years at the max. Now, that's fire production or at will. Okay, so if you want to start a fire at will, there's a specific way of doing it. If you want to control fire, you can get a lightning strike. So that's traditionally how it was done. But there is evidence from Neanderthals showing that they lived in cold caves in the dead of winter because there weren't any fires to use to start the fire. And the way hunter-gatherers make fire is with a, a, a tool called a, a hand drill. And it's a very difficult process. You and I, or anybody here, uh, we couldn't do it the first time we tried. It takes uh, a little bit of skill. So my point is, is that fire hasn't always been with us. And so, um, you know, well, that, I mean, that, you got to factor that into the equation. Yeah, as well. yeah. And I think that, you know, when we're eating bone marrow, we're getting calcium as well. Uh, you know, there's always, I think we, we, can pretty clearly say that hunter gatherers have been eating bone marrow for a long time and breaking bones and there's fragments of bones and bone marrow. So let's, let's go into that. It, we can look at the nutrient content of bone marrow and you can look at the nutrient content of blood as well. So, yeah. so yeah. if it, I don't know what nutritional software you use, but you can use nutritionist pro and nutritionist pro contains about every database that, is possibly imaginable. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not seeing that in, in that data. Oh, every time I've seen bone marrow talked about, there's calcium in bone marrow. And every time I've eaten bone marrow, I'm eating little flecks of bone in the bone marrow. So I think that humans well, getting, humans how getting if, how calcium. About call, how, how about if I call up, because I think in Nutritionist Pro, there's maybe six or eight different types of marrow and they're not showing high levels of calcium. Yeah, I just know that on all the, all the bone marrow supplements that I've ever taken, they always list calcium. And whenever I eat bones, I'm getting bone meal with the bone, you know? And so that's where I think, you know, and, and today, I mean, we can talk about what Neanderthals were doing, but on a carnivore diet, as I can construct it today, I can get calcium quite easily. Um, magnesium is quite interesting. I think that the main source that humans would have had for magnesium was water. Uh, I don't think there's any adequate source of magnesium uh, in, in the plant kingdom, especially not bioavailable magnesium at all. So if we look at the, uh, the oxalates and the phytic acid in plants, I don't think any of the magnesium is very bioavailable in plant foods. There's about 100 grams of magnesium that's probably much more bioavailable per pound of meat. Um, I appreciate what you're saying about the fat to protein ratios, and I agree with you there that, that the human ceiling for protein intake is probably about 35% of our calories from meat, but 35% of our calories from meat can be a lot of meat for a human. Um, it can be, you know, one and a half, two pounds of meat a day is easily within uh, our bodies, our liver's ability to do urea synthesis. And, you know, two pounds of meat a day is going to have 200 milligrams of of uh, magnesium. Uh, that's, that, that's, that's exactly my point. That's, enti that's entirely my point is if you are limited to 65% or more of your calories from fat, then the, the muscle tissue has to make up the balance. Muscle tissue it's, and organs. And I think that's what's been forgotten is that liver is very high in folate as are egg yolks. I mean, kidney is very high in folate, vitamin K2. I think when we, if we only look at the muscle meat, there are nutrient deficiencies well, that can occur. You're talking but... about a, a contemporary uh, diet composed of carnivorous foods and hunter gatherers for, you know, the last two and a half million years, uh, eggs were a seasonal food. So that's yeah. kind of, yeah, that's kind of out. Sure. But they didn't eat organs of animals. Of course they did. No, of, of course they did. Right. So, I mean, so folate, what... folate deficiency isn't an issue if you're eating the organs of an animal, nor is vitamin K2 or riboflavin. Um, or any, you know, no, so I'm, I'm not saying that I, I'm, I'm oh. saying that folate is 
problematic if all you're eating is protein. So if you right. exclusively eat liver, yeah. Well, not exclusively. I think if you eat liver in, in a, even in the proportions that it's found in animals, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get a decent amount of folate, especially if you eat it okay. with things like kidney or heart or other organs which have different compositions of folate than muscle meat. If you're only thinking about muscle meat, yeah. But, and the same is true with vitamin C, that, that the liver, the heart, the brain, uh, the spleen, the thymus, the pancreas, these are all much more rich sources of vitamin C than the muscle meat. And so I, I imagine, our, I, I'm pretty sure our ancestors would have eaten all of these. Uh, contemporary hunter-gatherers eat all of these. And so many of the nutrient deficiencies, I think, go away quickly when we're thinking about eating nose to tail. It was, it was interesting. So you were actually just talking about this on the episode I was listening to on the way here this morning. And, and you did bring up also the fact that you have to be careful about how much liver you eat because there's a, to a toxicity factor. Well, I think the that pe people wonder about vitamin A. I, I think it's questionable. But even, I mean, two ounces a day of liver is pretty safe. And, and that's, that's going to have a robust amount of folate in it. You know, that's not but, a... And then, and then there's kidney the and question, other organs question I want to ask you about, because this I found interesting, you sent this in the, in the email, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is an important one to us, is the, the sodium to potassium ratio. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, um, so what I would offer on this, I'll offer a couple of studies on this one real quickly, which will hopefully be interesting. So there are a number of um, sort of nuances with the sodium potassium ratio. The first one I'll just offer is this. So this one is, why isn't it bringing it to the front? Let's see if I can get it to go. So the, the concerns I have about limiting sodium. So um, on, on the paleo website, I, I saw something that suggested that um, hunter-gatherer diets um, had an average of 700 milligrams of sodium per day, which I thought that's, that's pretty low. And, and I suspect this is somewhere we will, we will all disagree a little bit, but let me see if I can get this one to come in front. Okay, so low salt diet and insulin resistance. This is a review paper. Um, from 2016, and it looks at multiple papers looking at various amounts of sodium. Mm -hmm. Now, we're, what we're talking about here is sodium intake rather than sodium chloride intake. So this is a summary of one, two, three, maybe 15 uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, crossover and parallel designs, looking at various methods of insulin resistance. Uh, usually it's uh, euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp um, or an insulin suppression test. But um, or an OGTT, and they're looking at various intakes of sodium and various durations, five to 16 days, and they're looking at insulin resistance. And what you'll see here is that uh, there's a pretty clear pattern that sodium intakes in, in the realm of 700 milligrams a day uh, are pretty clearly inducing high insulin resistance, even so here. Scroll down. These are not scrolling. Our... Next page. Next page. Chart down there. So if you, you dig, no, you just went past it. So take a look at this chart. What, if you dig into this particular review, what they point out is there's methodological issues with most of these studies over on the right, that A, they are a one week study giving very, very low levels of sodium, which is a shock to the system. You look on the left here, when you have a long-term study, so more than four weeks, you could actually see a low sodium diet improves insulin resistance. Likewise, controlling the restriction. So these over on the left are either sticking within the, the, what they, the, the recommendations for sodium, so at the low end, but not going below that one gram per day. Mm -hmm. And also long-term, all the ones on the right, which show increases in insulin resistance, were one-week studies. All the these ones, are shorter. These, they were shorter. These mm -hmm. ones on the left, and in particular, this is Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, which is the only controlled long-term study looking at both high salt and low salt consumption. And that study showed pretty conclusively that low salt improved insulin resistance, high salt increased insulin resistance. So don't agree with me on that. I do agree that if you suddenly dramatically reduce your sodium consumption, you're gonna have an impact. And it might be a short-term insulin resistance. It also has a catabolic effect on the body, but that's completely reversed after a couple of weeks. So actually, if you read the conclusions of this re review, it, they say the exact opposite of what you were just trying to show. They're that saying only, that it is that long-term, low sodium consumption improves insulin resistance. And let me just uh, point out to you guys that uh, 
the largest study ever done in hunter gatherers was done it was published in 1975 by jv neil and william oliver and they went down into the brazilian jungle and they looked at a, a group of people that they uh, were a null so a no salt culture they had absolutely zero salt and if you look at the aldosterone concentrations and sodium concentrations as well you can see that this these people were eating virtually no salt and uh, the estimated uh, salt content and maybe you could send him that paper because i sent it to you guys yeah, yeah. so um if, if you look at that study they they examined 506 uh, people in the entire, so virtually the entire tribe, everybody was examined for blood pressure. And if you look at it cross-sectionally, blood pressure stays low throughout life. It doesn't rise. Systolic blood pressure remains about 100, diastolic about 60, and it doesn't change over the course of life. So what do we know about insulin resistance and blood pressure? What happens to blood pressure with insulin resistance? Insulin resistance is highly associated with uh, hypertension. Bingo. So here, here you have a population over a course of a lifetime, 60, 70 years, they don't get any salt in their uh, diet. Blood pressure remains low. And then seven years later, Neil and Oliver went back and they monitored insulin resistance and glucose levels. And uh, I'll let you read those papers and decide for yourself. So I'll have Trevor and, and we'll send, send you those. If you don't mind, I'm going to quickly share my screen because I do want to show you two other studies that are actually relevant to a lot of what we've been talking about. What was These the... are both studies from, from 2018. So this first one, you can read right in the title. High salt intake causes leptin resistance and obesity in mice by stimulating endogenous fructose production. So you're saying you have concerns about fructose. Here's a study that actually shows that a high salt diet promotes uh, fructose. And I love this paragraph here, because that goes back to those short, the concern of those short-term studies. It says, in contrast to short-term studies, long-term, and this is in the purple here, uh, long-term intake of high salt diet associated with increased frequencies of obesity, insulin resistance, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and metabolic syndrome. Another how, study, how likewise- high, How high is the salt? Uh, that's a, sorry, it's down the map. As you can see, I write all over this. And I guess uh, so they did, they did multiple studies, but it was a 1% hypertonic salt solution for, you, you can see it over here on the left for 30 weeks in the mice. 30 weeks. Um, so that's a very long, that so 1% hypertonic. I'd have to, I mean, but how, they what were is... seeing effects. You can see over here on the right by week 13. What they actually initially saw was in the short run, you saw a catabolic effect in the mice that they would get lighter. Then after three weeks, you would see it reverse and the, the mice taking the salt solution would start getting, show, showing signs of obesity that you wouldn't see in the other mice. Mm -hmm. um, and then it would get quite dramatic by the 30 weeks. It's a fascinating study. I recommend it's very, a lot of details in it, but I'd recommend reading that one. I guess what I'm just wondering about here is, is this, is this even a reasonable amount of salt intake? What yes. would mice, yeah, what would and mice? Actually, they, they said it's, it's not that extreme. And that was one of the important things here. Another study is very interesting here. Again, this one gets complicated. What do they mean not that extreme? I mean, what is extreme for it, a Meaning mice? It's, it, it, it fits within what we would consider physiological levels for, for humans. For a human, but what is a mouse's species appropriate consumption of sodium? Well, that's, we, that's, that's we know. I mean. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, I mean that, you, can't, you can't compare apples to oranges there. I mean, yeah. do mice seek out sodium in the wilderness? Do mice have the same sort of physiologic... Uh, yeah, there's always an issue when you're, you're dealing with mice studies. Of Here's course, one that's actually a, a human and, that's looking at NLRP3, uh, mm -hmm. which is elevated by ROS production, so reactive oxygen species. And it shows that what this study talked about is this mechanism where NLP3 elevates IL-1B, which can lead to insulin resistance. And what they looked at is combination of a, a high salt diet in humans and then trying to counter that with potassium. If you scroll down and you look at the effects, the results here, potassium supplementation, ameliorated salt loading, induced oxidative stress in subjects. You can, you can kind of see in the titles here, potassium well, yes, exactly. reverse the active effects of salt loading, an NLRP3 and flammosomes. Again, fascinating study, quite complex, but I love right at the end, their conclusion is potassium, which is K, 
is abundant in fresh fruits and vegetables. Therefore, a greater fresh fruit and vegetable consumption or reasonable salt restriction could protect against the occurrence of insulin resistance and CVD. But potassium is also found in similar amounts gram per gram in animal meat. So that's what I wanted to ask you about, is, is where would you find the animal potassium meat, on a... Animal meat has as much potassium gram per gram as fruits and vegetables. That's, that's, that's nutritional fact that, you know, you'll get 14 to 1500. Oh, that's, that's not correct. We've that's, done a, that's we absolutely. A we have a spreadsheet listing about a thousand uh, naturally occurring foods. And so Trevor, maybe you can send him that spreadsheet. Sorry, this came out. Okay. Yeah. So that, that came from uh, uh, nutritionist pro and seven or eight different databases. So you might want to take a look at that. And it well, shows look at the, look at the, the what is the what is the content of sodium per 100 grams of muscle meat? Well, scroll down. We we've got it right here. So isn't that the meat up there? At the yeah. Top? Um, yeah. Does it go above that? You're 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 doing it for okay, 100 okay. 100 cal for a thousand calories. We don't have a thousand calories. Right. We could do it anyway. But so what you can see is that uh, um, the sodium to or potassium to sodium ratio is what averages 5.3. Yep. So, so my, I guess our point is, is where does the salt come from? What, where does the where salt does come the, from? Where does the sodium come from if, if you eat real food? It comes from, uh, you mean where does the sodium come from if you're eating real food as opposed to supplementing with like a sea salt or something like that? Well, you, it, to supplement with a sea salt, uh, you have to have technology. Yeah. Well, just, see, this is interesting. I've talked to other people about this, that, that um, there's pretty good evidence that animals move to mineral deposits, that animals seek out salt, um, that animals consistently go to salt licks, and that humans could have easily followed animal trails to salt licks and mineral licks. When I was on the Pacific Crest Trail, um, the animals were rabid for the salt from our sweat. We would pee on the ground, and there would be deer that would come straight out of the woods to lick the pee off the ground because they were so eager, they were so in need of the sodium. I mean, I think that, I don't I, think, I think any of us the is... same. I think we're on the same page here. We have five basic flavors or that sure. we perceive. Salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami, okay? okay? And so all of those have survival value. So our ner built into our nervous system through evolution is a, a predilection for these foods or avoidance of these foods. So. The bitter foods we avoid, the sweet and salty foods we seek out as we do the umami flavored foods. Um, so there, there's no doubt, salt is very rare in a terrestrial environment. Tell me where you're gonna find salt in a terrestrial environment. It just, it doesn't exist. And that's why the potassium to sodium ratio in a thousand foods here is, is you always get more potassium than you do sodium. Well, go to your, you go to your question about craving. I think this is something that's misinterpreted. Remember, we evolved in, a, in scarcity. So when we crave something, we don't crave it because it's in abundance and we eat it every day. We crave it because it's actually quite rare. And we evolved to, if we, if we encounter it, to make sure we eat it because we might not encounter it again. And they've shown that our, our desire for salt is, is one of our strongest desires, which is an indicator that it's actually rarer to find it. I don't know that I'd agree with that. I would say that's probably an indication that it's a critical nutrient in human physiology. It is a critical nutrient, so you have a craving well, for it. Wait a minute, well, let's talk about human it. physiology. You're familiar with the sodium potassium ATPase pump, right? Sure. So there's four, there's four major or six major ions that oh, we as all uh, vertebrates have to deal with calcium and magnesium, sodium and potassium, and hydrogen ions, either acid or base. So those are the, ma the six major ions that our body has to regulate. And so those ion ions have been regulated from the very beginnings of life on earth, 2.6, 2.7 billion years ago. Those cellular mechanisms in the membrane were already in place. So I, I guess the question comes up is, if you look at those mechanisms, why does the sodium potassium ATPase pump blow out sodium and take in potassium? Similarly, uh, 
if you look at the calcium to magnesium ratio, it takes in magnesium and blows out calcium. So uh, the typical cell, uh, whether it's a human, a reptile, a fish, or whatever, contains very tightly regulated uh, amounts of these six ions. And so when you look at the hydrogen ion concentration, acid base, it tends to have more base than acid. And when those ions get out of whack, as they do in cancer and heart disease, then we have a lot of problems. And one of the ways in which they get out of whack is by a high salt diet, what would be considered a moderate salt diet in, in the typical Western diet. And what that does is sodium impairs that sodium to potassium ATPase pump. And over the course of decades and a lifetime, it allows more sodium intracellularly and less potassium. So this information is just relatively recently known because of the way in which you have to measure intracellular sodium. You have to develop specific NMR probes to do it without going in and screwing up what those ratios are. And uh, this is Titze's work, T-I-T-Z-E. And uh, it's just, it's fascinating. And um, we'll send you some papers to look at this. Yeah, I'm not, sure I, I'm not sure I agree with all that. So in those papers oh, that you, okay. were, you were showing, Trevor, um, the, you were talking about the potassium. And I think that there's this, uh, I'm not aware, I think that there, um, I've never seen any good evidence that there's an absolute requirement for a certain sodium to potassium ratio. I think that there's probably a, a need for potassium in the human diet. I think most of would agree there's a need for potassium in the human diet, but I don't think that the ratio, I think the ratio has been widely misinterpreted uh, by many people. And as you point out in those papers, um, I think that a lot of what gets skewed in these people is that when they are doing lower salt diets, they are probably potassium deficient. So in that study that I showed, looking at the many uh, low salt versus uh, higher salt diet studies. What we don't know, uh, unfortunately, without looking at individual studies, is any individual subject's insulin resistance, um, how much of that sodium they're holding on to, and what their baseline potassium level is. Uh, yeah. My premise is and that- actually that review you showed us pointed out the exact of that fact, that there is an issue in all those studies that they weren't looking at salt sensitivity in individuals. They weren't looking at whether they were already uh, uh, they had high blood pressure, whether they were insulin resistant already. And they said that actually there was very con low control in all these studies. It's challenging, but I, I think that um, I am not convinced that in the, in the setting of adequate potassium, which I think a meat-based diet would provide because meat is so rich in potassium, that higher amounts of salt are in any way, shape or form detrimental to the human body. I mean, we can manage it, we can exclude it. I would love to see some of this research suggesting that higher sodium breaks the sodium potassium ATPase. I've never seen that. Um, I think it's pretty clear that if we go too low on sodium, we are going to develop insulin resistance. Now, where we draw that line is questionable. Um, I've seen well, it. So, I mean, I just, I've not seen the, I've sent you a lot of studies showing that high salt diets are associated with insulin resistance. The only studies that I have found are the ones you just pointed out uh, show, uh, that, that make you're any sort of me, claim about you low me, sodium. You sent me and those are all one week. Those are all one week studies. You said, did you send me epidemiology studies that no, high salt these are these are the ones I, the ones I just showed you. Those are in are, rice. Are, those are in mice. <laughs> no, no one was about, human. How about the human studies? How do you explain the the Yanomamo people? Five hundred people were studied for blood pressure over the course of a lifetime, cross sectionally, and blood pressure doesn't rise. So, how do they how do they become insulin resistant if, if low salt and a no salt culture causes low blood pressure over the course of a lifetime in 500 people. How many, how much salt were they getting per day? Um, I think it was around a, less than a hundred grams. A hundred milligrams? Uh, right. A hundred yeah, mi milligrams. Yeah. That, that's, that to me is, I'd have to see the study. That to me is okay, a little Trevor, bit Trevor, pull it up and, and send it to him. No, it's not far-fetched. A hundred milligrams of sodium is, is essentially, that's, that's an, like a they lot were, of physical. I don't have that one available. I'm looking right oh. at that review. They said, you want a human study? It says right no, on the I, last page, this Korean study is one of the only long-term properly controlled studies with 120 subjects. And it shows that 
well, low sodium diet improves insulin resistance. But, but can you in, in people who that, are potassium deficient, in people who send, are in people who are insulin resistant no, at baseline? Which, which one am I looking okay, for? Okay, it's the, I sent you that one on the, the email this morning. Oh yeah, let me pull that up. And pull that one up. And we're in the sodium it. weeds. We're in the sodium weeds. We're we're We've battling about sodium. I, I think what we have to do here is is get to the point of us we, we've kind of reached that point of disagreement we need to sort of yeah. summarize a disagreement and come back with maybe some yeah. maybe we do a written blog together yeah okay. kind of point, you know mark um, do you have blood work do you know your fasting insulin level this one right there Which, um one? i haven't done it in a while oh, no. the, what do you, do you what was yeah, it in the yeah, past? yeah yeah that's the one so um, i'm pulling up the You guys there? Yep. Can you hear us? Okay. Yeah. So here's the paper. Do you want me to share this? Sure. Getting good at Zoom here. This is my my first. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize about the video. That was a, a last minute thing. But uh, yeah, here's here's the uh, here's the paper. Okay. Yeah, so, so ten ten milli equivalents of sodium. Tell me that's not low. <laughs> what is that uh that's in their diet yes i'd have to do the comp i'd have to do the equation what is 10 milli equivalents of sodium how many milligrams a day is that they uh, placed for brief periods on 10 milli equivalents of sodium diets brief well, periods just read, read, read the paper okay well i can't read it right okay there. okay right well there. well how about if we go down to the tables that show it shows aldosterone it shows okay there's the blood pressure, pressure. Yeah, and there's the blood pressure. This is 506 people. Right. Okay. I guess we're, okay, we're, so they, we're so equating words, that. Did they measure fasting insulin? Um, yes, but in another paper. What was their fasting insulin on? on I don't have that on the top of my head, but we'll send you the second paper. Okay. Well, will send these to you. Look, I, I think Mark had the good point. That, yeah. You know, we, we have so far, you know, first... 70 minutes here we're all on the same page here and i think the other thing we're on the page is watching a ridiculous movie like game changers where they take somebody who's on a uh, nothing but fast food diet have them eat something crazy and then show them his blood is hazy and say look how bad a, a meat-based diet is for you i think you know we, we we do have to step back here and go you know we're getting into the weeds here but there's a whole lot of places that we're in agreement here yeah. I I'd asked you about this a little bit before the podcast, Trevor. Do you have a fasting insulin? I know Mark said he doesn't have a fasting insulin level from his blood work. Yeah, I had had mine a while ago. And to remember, I'm a competitive uh, cyclist. I still race with the, the pros. Uh -huh. uh, and I go, again, this is an end of one, but I can tell you my, my insulin sensitivity is quite good. Do you know it? How do you measure that? Uh, I mean, I don't, I tried looking for it. I don't really keep that stuff because I get frustrated with my doctors uh, when they try to tell me about my, my diet. But, um, you know, the last time I had it measured, it was quite good. And just again, the end of one, this is never something I would try to publish. I can tell you if I grabbed a bag of Skittles and eat it, I feel like I was having a heart attack. I show all the, the signs that you would expect to see of somebody who's, who's highly insulin, insulin sensitive. Right, right. I guess it's just, yeah, when, whenever I ask people about their fasting insulin, they may say, oh, it's really good. And I, well, what's the number? Because here's my concern that, that, you know, I think that a lot of the problem with insulin resistance is hyperinsulinemia. I don't think it's glucose refusal at the level of the muscle. That happens physiologically with low carbohydrate diets. I, I don't know. I think that it's hyperinsulinemia that is driving a lot of the problems with insulin resistance and potentially causing uh, you know, smooth muscle, muscle hyperplasia and the artery walls and et cetera, et cetera. We, I think that we, we know that postprandial uh, glucose spikes can affect the glycocalyx at the level of the blood vessels. And I wonder if that has to do with postprandial insulin spikes as well. And so I'm getting more and more interested in, in insulin levels. And so I see that as a pretty cut and dry arbiter. Uh, and I would love to see those numbers on someone with such low salt yeah. intake. You know, um, most of the time on, on on carnivore diets, we see fasting insulin levels of two or three. Um, and I personally would consider something above four or five to be abnormal. And so, 
you know, if, if, if uh, I don't know this to be the case, but I would be curious, you know, if, if you're eating a diet with 500 milligrams of sodium per day and your fasting insulin is eight or nine, I would say, mm, we can make an argument. I don't know if that's what your number is because we don't have the numbers, but that's my concern is that fasting insulin is going to have to work very hard um, to conserve all of that sodium. And, um, and that could have problematic consequences down the line. I don't think we want fasting insulin to be eight or nine on a low salt diet. And if we increased your salt and your fasting insulin went down, we can make an argument that your body is saying, ah, thank you for a little bit of sodium. Um, I think that a lot of the research that looks at higher sodium diets and insulin resistance is, is epidemiology. It's not interventional. I've never seen an interventional trial um, that shows that in a, in a population that is potassium, that is getting adequate amounts of potassium. I think that there well, is- I just, uh, I just showed you the one. I'll, I'll dig up some others and, and send them to you. Again, going back to your, your N of one, I'll, I'll give you a completely another way of uh, kind of beating around the bush here. But the one thing I have been doing with a, a lab, so my, my other world is the sports world. I do a podcast on endurance sports, uh, science, and I work with a, a lab called CU Sports. Um, and we've been analyzing my, uh, my muscle glycogen. And I just, I get them to shake their heads because mine is just always replete or yeah, replete. Uh, we, I even did a fasting, went out and did a couple hour ride, came back and you, you'd barely seen any drop in my, uh, in my muscle glycogen. And so certainly if I was, I would assume if I was extremely insulin resistant, that's not what you would see. You, why would, I guess I, I'm not sure that's a great surrogate marker for that. I guess, yeah, it, like I said, I don't have the blood test in my insulin right, levels right. To, to tell you, I'm just yeah, showing yeah. you some, telling you some of the signs that as an athlete. Yeah. Just the ability to go out, ride five, six hours. Uh, I guess what I'm suggesting is, is there's subclinical hyperinsulinemia here that, that the body is kind of just holding onto sodium like crazy and other things. That's my concern with these low sodium diets. I think that they're probably problematic. For people. Would, what would you consider a low sodium diet? Um, I would probably say anything below 2000 to 3000 milligrams of sodium a day. Okay. You, need to, you need to read a paper that Tony Sebastian and I wrote in 2017. So we'll send that paper to you as well. Tony Sebastian is a nephrologist. He spent his entire career uh, looking at the sodium, potassium, blood pressure, blah, 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 blah. He's got a colleague, you probably heard of her, Linda Frasetto. Linda Frasetto has done uh, some of the few randomized controlled trials of uh, contemporary hunter-gatherer diets. And so Mark has a list of all 50 studies that have been published. And uh, he told me that uh, there's not a single study on carnivore diets in the medical literature. But we have now 40 or 50 studies of paleo diets. There's definitely two studies of a carnivore diet in the medical literature. There was one done at, at Harvard looking at the gut microbiome, and there was one done uh, at Bellevue Hospital a number of years ago, looking at uh, Philomer Stephenson, who lived with the Eskimo and the Inuit. And his, yeah, I, uh, I don't want to put my um, research. Yeah, I've read those papers. On the line Could you? I have it. I'd love to see those if you can send them. Those, it, was a, it was a quick, just a literary review. I just want to PubMed just out of interest just to see what was published. Um, and I didn't see anything come up, but my, you know, I didn't exactly, I wouldn't want to lay my, uh, uh, my research capabilities on just that little brief periods. So. Yeah. And there are numerous published case reports as well. Yeah, and yeah, yeah things think, like this. You know, so yeah, I think so, what we want to try to do here, like I've always um, said many times um, that the discussions get confusing for the listener, right? You move on to another area without the disagreement at hand being solved. So I think we, you know, we had this agreement sort of conversation and then if, if I were to summarize, I think for the audience, we go, well, where have we disagreed? Where are we starting to argue? And, and that's where we then, I think, need to focus and come back maybe another time. And rather than just throw a study up with you haven't had a chance to read yet and, and we, you might right. come back with us, we go, okay, what are the things that we're really challenging ourselves here? And it, it sounds to me that you're going, you don't think the ratio of sodium potassium is, is as important that we perhaps do. So that might be point one that we go, go back to our camps and go, okay, let, let's bring some uh, ammunition back to the, the argument later with that. Um, 
Um, I think perhaps, um, I don't know whether, well, you've certainly stated what you consider low sodium would probably be um, where we would be. If you'd have said, you know, much, much lower than perhaps we would do. I think we've done with the analysis of what, unless you go to the salt lick, I, our, our data shows that you can't get to the levels that perhaps you're suggesting. So that's another area we could go back uh, and bring that, that, those ammunition back to the discussion. Sure. Um, where else did we? Well, I, I don't know what you guys, I, I was trying to make some points about the, uh, the nutrients and then we kind of got off track on the sodium. Um, my feeling is that a carnivore diet is not nutrient deficient in, in any uh, nutrients. I think we were specifically focused uh, on, on sodium. We weren't saying yeah. a carnivore diet was deficient in sodium, but we got off on the sodium uh, rabbit hole. But yeah, can so. I can I interject there? Sure. I, this is actually a, more of a question for you because as you yeah. were sort of talking about if you eat nose to tail and you're eating the brain, you're eating everything else. And in fact, you know, when you look at hunter gatherers, when they would kill an animal, the, 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 the brain and the heart, you know, these organs that obviously would have some of these nutrients were kind of sacred. And the, the person that did the kill would often get given that. So how much is available? I don't, perhaps you've got the research on that. When you talk about the nutrients, um, in the, and certainly, there's no question, I think we would agree, certain times of the year, you, you're going to be a carnival, right? We, we all agree on that. So your argument is you can do it long term. We're saying, hey, we don't think you can do it long term. To the point of the, the organs and the brain being available with nutrients, have you done a dietary analysis, a whole tribe, is there enough to go around? There's plenty of meat and fat, but is there enough of those organs and that would be an interesting area to, to, to look at because then I guess if there was plenty to go around, you might win the argument. If, if there isn't enough to go around, we might go, hey, you need a supplement with fruits and vegetables to get it. Right. I think it depends on the size of the animal that you're hunting. And that goes back to the points about contemporary hunter-gatherers being limited by marginalization and political, sociopolitical norms and you know, mass animal extinction. I think if you're hunting woolly mammoths, there's enough to go around. You know, If you're hunting buffalo... There's enough to go around. I mean, a liver and a buffalo is 12 pounds. You know, uh, you got a liver and a spleen and a heart. I mean, you've got 40, 50 pounds of organ meat in a buffalo. To share among a tribe. Look, look at it as a percentage. Um, you know what I mean? I you mean, could. Yeah, you know, just to just to give a finite view. You know, uh, it's 12 pounds, but how many how many people in are in the tribe? I, 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 who knows how many are in the truck how many buffalo are there there were a hundred million you know i think that and then, right and then the questions get to become you know what is doable today you know can i construct a carnivore diet today from white oak pastures of El campo and, and not get nutrient deficient and can i create a diet today that that allows me to have the maximum amount of nutrients without any plant toxins because we didn't, we didn't also get into a lot of the plant toxins that might be included on a traditional paleolithic diet, like oxalates. You know, I mean, there are a lot of high oxalate foods that people might eat. That, so again, and then, you know, I have some pretty distinct views on, on many polyphenols like resveratrol and curcumin, and I don't think that they're necessary for humans. I think they're actually probably pretty damaging. So um, uh, if you guys are familiar with my work, you'll, you can read about that. But, you know, I think that there's you know, a carnivore diet eliminates all plant foods. There's, there's no need to get any of these plant anti-nutrients at all if I can construct it in a way that has all the nutrients I need or be very discerning about the plants that I do eat from a different perspective. So, Okay, so once again, uh, you know, I always like to let the data speak for itself and try to, you know, downplay charismatic uh, individuals, scientists, what have you. Um, but I think that if you were to take the diet that you recommend on a daily basis and just lay it out for us. Tell us how much of this meat, how much of that, which organ here, which organ that. And um, then let's, let's run it through nutritionist pro. That's what I did with the ketogenic diet. Oh, it's, it's pretty much I, been I, done. No, I mean, could you send that to yeah. us? Yeah. I mean, oh. there was a, I can pull it up for you right now. There was a guy, um, I think of his name. He, uh, on, uh, he has a whole nutritional analysis and he did a nutritional analysis of my diet. And it was like, there's, you can get everything you need on a no to tail carnivore well, diet. Well, wait a minute. If some guy did it for you, I'm talking about you doing it yourself. It was, it was, a, exactly it was a, it was a well-respected guy in the community. I'm thinking I blanking on his name, but he has a, a program that he uses and he coaches people with this. And 
he ran it through the whole thing. I mean, we can do well, it, you know? Yeah, well, well so, so we did too. And uh, I published this paper at researchgate.net, okay? It's not a, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's not a juried. Uh, it's also on our website. Yeah, it's, it's right. So we did this analysis of the typical ketogenic diet which limits carbohydrate. Right, right. But I, I think, less. let me just pause you there because I don't need a typical ketogenic diet. Let me screen share. Um, I'll screen share this yeah, with you. Do. So this is Marty Kendall, right? So he has this optimizing nutrition and um, he did a whole post on this. And, um, you know, you can see it here and I don't need exactly what was on here. I changed some things and some of the things he estimated were incorrect. But, you know, you can look at... Um, the chronometer nutrient profile of what I was getting in a day. And you can see here all the B vitamins, you know, vitamin C I'm not was about B, B vitamins. That okay. There's only, there's only four nutrients, five that you have to worry about potassium, magnesium. So there we have the potassium, which you see potassium, is 68%. Potassium. Potassium. So well, so, but pause. Yeah, so he's wait, 68% wait. of the RDA, right? But there's no RDA for potassium. There's never been an RDA yeah. for potassium. But so, you know, we believe there, the ratio is very important. We can, we definitely love to have that conversation so with we, you about whether the ratio right. is or not. And that is what but, we So we would on. look at this and say, that's a three to one sodium to potassium. No, actually, there, actually, there are recommended values for potassium and we reported those in a jury paper that Sebastian and I wrote in 2017. Yeah, so I mean, obviously this K two is look wrong because his look at look at magnesium. Where's that? I can't. Magnesium see is one hundred and one percent, so four hundred and twenty two milligrams of magnesium a day. Uh, manganese is low well, because well, I didn't what need. What software? Much. What software was this? Did this use? He uses. I think he uses. I mean, you can look at this post. It's Martin. Mark, I don't optimized. care about that's anecdotal. What software was he using? I think he used chronometer. I don't know what chronometer is. Right. So. Does I mean, he have the actual, the, the, what the, the meal was, what the menu was? Yeah, yeah. I what would be my... interesting if you sent that to us, we'd yeah. put it in Nutrition as Pro and see. Yeah, we, we could do it. I'd yeah. be very interested in doing that. Yeah, so that's yeah, all here. That, that sounds like a good point to focus on is, are we even arguing about the same thing? Like, so, you know, and then we, yeah. we might be coming back to, should people not be using this software? I don't know. Well, I think that the main thing that we disagree on is the sodium potassium ratio, yeah, because I think exactly. it's, it's pretty easy to demonstrate that you can get plenty of magnesium on a carnivore diet. I think most of the magnesium is from spring water anyway. Um, you can get plenty of folate, you can get plenty of riboflavin, you get plenty of B vitamins, you can get these things, you can get potassium. We disagree about the sodium to potassium ratio. That that's a nuance. Like biggest, yeah, that's the, probably the biggest nuance right that we're going to disagree on. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think discussions regarding uh, ketogenic diets are relevant because everyone is going to construct them differently. And a lot of medical That's ketogenic right. diets are very high in fat with a four to one ratio. And if you're eating an adequate amount of protein and organ meats, you can get many of these nutrients. We can go down the vitamin C rabbit hole if you want, but I've done that many times before. And I think the interventional studies are pretty weak in showing that any, you know, that, that large amounts of vitamin C are beneficial for humans or that humans need large amounts of vitamin C. On, so on, the, qu on, the question I have for you then, obviously let's, I'm, I'm a big fan of as much as looking at the literature, there is Sure. You know, down, down on the, where the rubber meets the road, you're in there in the trenches. I've done it with the, the paleo diet for 30 years and had great results. You're obviously arguing you're getting great results and you're doing presumably blood work and you're happy with the blood work that's coming out. What's the time length that you've, you've had people uh, do your diet? Well, I mean, there's people in the community that have been doing it for 20 years, um, you know, and then how much, how much of that is pure carnivore versus throwing in some fruit? I think there are people in the community who have been doing it for 20 years, pure carnivore. How about, how about designing a contemporary study, uh, a randomized controlled trial crossover uh, with a, an adequate sample size, let's say 30 to 60 people, and doing the blood workup, doing the nutritional analysis, and then publishing it. So, so... You know, sure. I challenge I challenge people I challenge people uh, in the er, the late '80s to do a paleo diet, and now we have about 50 studies. I don't know if they're all randomized controlled crossovers, but a few of them are. And um, these diets, uh, you know, are are very therapeutic. 
Yeah, and we're planning to do studies. It's just, you know, they take time. They take time and money. So well, we, the, for, the one thing we have in common is we, we've been where you are at now. <laughs> right? They take, they take time and money to do. And, uh, you know, first of all, we're trying to tell people this isn't absurd, you know, that, that people were hunter-gatherers. And so I think when we think about this, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up, I want to respect your time, and I appreciate you guys being so generous with your time. Um, you know, one thing that we agreed upon was that people were carnivore for some amount of time. And the question yeah. becomes, are they slowly developing nutrient deficiencies? Are they slowly getting ill or are they doing just fine and then not being able to hunt the animals as much? And is it sustainable to eat an entirely or virtually entirely animal-based diet? And these are the sort of interesting conversations. I mean, there's, there's now thousands of anecdotes of people who are resolving autoimmune disease. And I think that the key here, the only reason we're asking these questions is that a lot of people like myself don't resolve eczema. We don't resolve autoimmunity on paleolithic diets that still include some plant foods. And so it's, we say, well, can a human survive on only animal foods? And there's some pretty compelling um, suggestion and, and literature to suggest that it's possible and doable and can lead to quite good health. I mean, if you look at people in the community, they're doing really well. And the blood work that I've done is extensive and looks fine, you know? Inflammatory so have you, have you measured uh, your HLA and haplotype? Yeah, I don't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, it's not, uh, I, I have measured it, yeah. Well, there's a, a bunch of susceptibility haplotypes for autoimmunity, and they fit into, what, about 12 categories? Uh, Trevor, I can't remember that we know of. Yeah, so uh, uh, that would be interesting if you're bringing up anecdotal N of ones, it'd be interesting to see what your HLA haplotype is. Yeah, if some people- it fits into, uh, in the, into one of those known susceptibility haplotypes. Yeah, I think it's possible. Yeah, and some people are more sensitive than others. Dr. Saldino, since you said we're, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here, I just what I was getting at when I brought up the game changers before is if we were debating with them and they brought that, that silly blood study to us, we, we wouldn't have gotten into a passionate conversation at all because we just would have said there's nothing scientific about that. I know we, we got a little passionate here, but I just wanted to say – that's because this is really interesting and you clearly are, are, are very well read um, and would love to continue having some of these conversations with I love you it. because they're just, they're, they're really interesting conversations. And they're super interesting conversations. And I think the sodium stuff is at the center of it because we're all trying yeah. to figure it out. I do think that, and maybe we can do a part two at some point in the future. I'd love to get into more of the, the ketogenic stuff because, um, and I'll just tease this for the audience and we can table this for next time. But, I suspect that the majority of the time free living humans would have been in ketosis. And so I wasn't sure whether you guys had problems with ketogenic diets as they were constructed or ketosis as human physiology, because ketogenic human physiology, as far as I can tell, is probably the norm for humans rather than a carbohydrate based metabolism. But we may have to table that for another day. Yeah. And I do promise if we do this again, I will figure out this camera thing. I, I, bought this camera on the, the way here. And uh, I just noticed, I think my face is entirely black. That's all right. I can't see my face at all. <laughs> so did, I apologize about that. We did, we did what we could. And I appreciate you guys coming on. So where can people find more of the work from, from you guys? Well, so we do have a website. It's the paleodiet.com. And that's in the middle. We are tossing out what we have right now. And in April, we're launching a brand new website. Uh, it's got most of the Dr. Cordain's writings from the last 10 years. So the, the, what he wrote about the keto diet, salt diet, all that is up there. Dr. Cordain is on ResearchGate. So anybody who has access to that, he's been putting a lot up there. That's all, those of, are the, all of my publications are available on ResearchGate. There's over a hundred of them. Did we lose you? No, I'm here. Okay, sorry. Okay, we so had silence for a second there. Is that, yeah, was that so, where, is that where we can find you guys? Okay, Yep. awesome. And then uh, the last question I always ask my guests is what is the most radical, what is the most radical thing that you have done recently? Oh boy. <laughs> I'm not sure you want my answer to that. Of course I want your answer to that. Well, do you, Mark, do you want to go first, Dr. Cordain, or do you want me to tell mine? Oh, go okay. ahead. I need to talk about the most dangerous one. So as I said, I, I still race in the, the pro peloton from time to time. So I was in a race down in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, it's, it's a fun race, but it's a really dangerous race. And I was 
um, trying to catch back up to the lead rider. So there's a, a group of cars behind the Peloton uh, that I was weaving through. So I had to go into the other lane of traffic and the road mm. was supposed to be closed. Coming down a hill in the rain and a car came the other way. I tried to swerve, crashed, hit the ground, fractured my hip. I was sliding head first towards this car. Uh, got up on my elbows and basically slammed my back into the car. <laughs> then some of the cars from the race stopped. They picked me up. They put me inside a car. And then one of the guys went to check out my bike and started fixing it. And all that went through my head was, oh, he's fixing my bike. I guess I need to keep racing. So I got out of the car with a broken hip, got back on the bike and raced another two and a half hours. <sighs> That's... That's intense. That's pretty radical. <laughs> well, you know what's the worst part of it is 10 kilometers from the finish, I got a flat tire. No vehicles had any spare wheels left. So after doing that, I still had to abandon the race. Oh, that's brutal. Oh, my goodness. Well, I shouldn't so have let you go first. because I was going to say, you sure you wanted me to go first? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, the problem I have is I was a competitive rugby player, but I, that was in my past. So uh, I think the most radical thing I've probably done recently is a, eat a pizza or something like that. You know, a whole wheat pizza too. <laughs> Why would you do that? Uh, Dr. Cordain, anything radical from you? Um, I'll be 70 in October. So I'm in that retirement community. I've been retired since 2013. And the most radical thing I've done in the last three and a half months, and Trevor can attest to this, is we moved into our retirement home. <laughs> and it's a beautiful home. <laughs> Where is it? Where do you live now? I, I live in Fort Collins. We just moved from one side of town to the other. We lived in a great big house where we raised all of our three sons and uh, we've now moved into a much smaller house. Uh, but it's right on the edge of town and we've got wildlife. We have mountain lion, bobcats, fox, deer, everything out of the yard. I love it. That sounds amazing. Yeah, that's radical. That's, that's pretty radical. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, guys. I appreciate you all and I look forward to our next conversation. Well, I hope so. I got to say, I'm, I think I'm speaking for all of us. I think this is one of the more engaging conversations we've had in a while. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, you guys, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed that one. Like I said, lots of stuff in that one from a few months ago. Still learning, changing my ideas. Not on salt. Listen to the show notes. Look at the show notes if you want tons of data about salt and how important it is for insulin sensitivity and good blood pressure and all that stuff. But if you um, have questions about fructose, stay tuned. I'm going to be posting a lot about that in the near future. And I will do a whole podcast on that, hopefully in the next week or so. So that is super exciting. Uh, sign up for my newsletter at carnivoremd.com. You can go to the carnivorecodebook.com to pre order my book. Thank you for the support. Ebook, print, and audio are available. I recorded it in my voice, and believe me, for the audiobook, I recorded it a little more slowly. <laughs> I tend to talk real fast because I get excited, but the audiobook is a really high production, totally professional production, and it's in yours truly, this voice that you all know and love. Maybe. I hope. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'm loving Austin, meeting some awesome people here, checking out environmental hormesis, cold plunging, saunas, swimming in lakes and rivers, getting sunlight, exercising. This is what it's about. We don't need plant hormetics. We got environmental hormesis, you guys. So check out the Ocean Lab if you are in Austin. I so hope that KetoCon next year will be here and that I will meet you all, give you high fives and hugs and carnivore fist bumps and elbow bumps or leg bumps or whatever we're going to do. Uh, in person because I miss my people. I miss my tribe. If you want to be a part of my tribe, go to Carnivore MD, sign up for that newsletter. I promise it will bring value to your life. I will do my best to fulfill that promise. Anyway, thanks for your support, guys. Please leave this podcast a review on iTunes. It is now over 800 reviews with a five-star average. We are crushing it. Thanks for leaving a review for my book on Amazon. If you've read it, over 520 reviews, five-star average. I'm just so honored that I get to do this work and that you guys find value in it. So thank you so much and stay radical. And I cannot wait to talk to you next week. Bye.